World Series can get tough. And if you're down three games to one, like the Braves were on Thursday, sometimes it seems like nothing goes right. Yes, the World Series can get tough. But you know what they say about when the going gets tough. series you gotta win four in no particular order and how tough do you get when it's your last chance Well, their team was down three games to one in a foreign stadium, but the Braves held on to utter three of the kindest words in the English language. Honey, I'm home. The South has risen again. And folks, I'll tell you, if you want to talk about chopping a deficit before it's too late, these fans are all ears. So come on in and make yourself at home for game six. We'll do our best to give you the best seat in the house. Hi again, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien. Welcome to our CBS Sports continuing coverage of the 1992 World Series. Tonight, the Blue Jays will send out David Cohn. Atlanta will counter with Steve Avery. Braves fans are well aware that the last five teams who have come home down a game have each rallied to win the World Series. And Blue Jays fans know that as well. 40,000 of them have gathered tonight up at Sky Dome. Right now, it's time for the singing of the two national anthems. And here is public address announcer Marshall Mann. To honor Canada, join in the singing of the Canadian anthem, which will be performed tonight by Scotty Brothers recording artists from Toronto, the Nylons. The 
Stadium, where the stage is set for game six of this fall classic and for what could be the last picture show of this 1992 World Series we turn it over to Sean McDonough and Tim McCarver Mr. Saturday Night and uh, Mr. Baseball fellas <laughs> <laughs> thank you Pat and good evening everyone welcome to game six of the World Series with Toronto leading three games to two the scenario is just about the same as it was for game five the Blue Jays still one win away from their first world championship and Atlanta still in a do or die situation. But certainly with Atlanta's win in game five, there is a lot more pressure on the Toronto Blue Jays as the series returns to Atlanta. And it was here on their home field that the Braves took game one. Damon Berryhill's three run homer off Jack Morris in the sixth inning gave Atlanta all of its runs in a three to one victory. And in game two, Ed Sprague sprang off the bench to hit a two run pinch home run off of Jeff Reardon as Toronto wins five to four in game three of Toronto Candy Maldonado's bases loaded single with one out of the ninth off Jeff Reardon knocked in the winning run Roberto Alomar chopped his way home from third as Toronto prevailed three to two to take a two games to one lead and speaking of chopping Devon White with a chopper through the left side to score Kelly Gruber in the seventh inning of game four the decisive run is to what Toronto went up three games to one a two to one victory and in game five with the Braves fighting to stay alive Lonnie Smith's grand slam off Morris in the fifth have the Braves and their fans jumping for joy as Atlanta won seven to two to send this series back to Atlanta so tonight Toronto has its second chance to wrap up the series and they turn to David Cohn when they acquired him from the Mets in late August it was with this game really in mind they thought he was the man who could put them over the hump in their quest for their first world champion and how did the uh, Atlanta Braves beat him they are patient at the plate and aggressive on the bases control problems for David Cohn and look for the Braves to run and run a lot he'll be opposed tonight by Steve Avery and here is our Jim Cobb thanks Sean you Steve Avery in game three had probably the best curveball he's had in a long time and the challenge when you face the same lineup four days later is if you don't have that same stuff, plan B. You might see him throw a few more changeups and fastballs. Blue Jays are good fastball hitters. As Tim said, David Cohn tried to strike hitters out with the first pitch in his last start. He can't do that. He has to get him in no ball, two strike counts. Then he can put him away with a splitter or slider, and that's when he dominates the game. Play ball, Sean. Thank you Jim Steve Avery getting ready to go to work against the Toronto lineup that has Devon White leading off in center field Roberto Alomar at second base batting third and at first base again tonight Joe Carter the cleanup hitter right fielder Dave Winfield Andy Maldonado gets the start in left field Kelly Gruber bats sixth at third base the catcher is Pat Borders batting seventh the shortstop Manuel Lee hits eighth and batting ninth the pitcher David Cohn. The defense for the Atlanta Braves. He did not start a league championship series game. This is his fourth start in the World Series. Deion Sanders in left field. Otis Nixon will be the center fielder. And David Justice, the right fielder. Gary Pendleton on the infield at third. Jeff Blauser at shortstop. Mark Lemke will be the second baseman. Sid Bream, the first baseman. And once again, Damon Berryhill behind the plate. It is another delightful night in the capital of Georgia 67 degrees the game time temperature a light breeze out of the west and the forecast is for clear skies throughout the night and the umpires working this one John Shulock of the American League behind the plate Jerry Crawford at first base Mike Riley at second Joe West at third 
Dan Morrison along the left field line and Bob Davidson of the National League in right. Another sellout crowd on hand as you might expect as Pat O'Brien told you 5,000 Braves fans were at the airport at the wee small hours of the morning after game five when the Braves returned at about four o'clock in the morning. And they're on the feet all over the ballpark as this one is about to begin. Game six of the 1992 World Series and Devon White will get it started. He's four for 21. And here's the first pitch of the night from Steve Avery. Fastball high and away and we're underway. White has four hits in the World Series but three of them came in game four. Line to left and it falls in for a hit in front of Deion Sanders. So Devon White takes the second pitch of the night in the left and he's aboard with nobody out in the top of the first. This game more than any other game matches two pitchers who have a very difficult time holding runners on. The home run ball has been prominent in the World Series up to now but look for the running game in this game. Steve Avery 42 stolen bases against him this year. The most of any National League pitcher and David Cohn with 49 against him. Devon White has not stolen a base in the postseason. And Roberto Alomar looks at the ball. 1 and 0 on Alomar, who's just 2 for 18 in the series. And 0 for his last six. Avery to first. White stole 37 bases during the regular season, was only thrown out four times. But in the playoffs against Oakland, he was 0 for 4 in attempting to steal. And he has not attempted a stolen base in the World Series in large part because he hasn't been on. He's offered this pitch. Barry Hill's throw, much too late. And Devon White has his first stolen base of the postseason in the Blue Jays' fourth without being caught in the World Series. That high leg kick by Steve Avery, what? Allows Devon White a huge jump at first base and Barry Hill's throw too late. No catcher will throw him out with that kind of jump. A strike on Alomar. Those were Alomar's numbers during the regular season. He was fourth in the major leagues and third in the American League with runners in scoring position. Good job of hitting. You can see Alomar make the effort to slap the ball to the right side and move right to third with one out. That'll bring up Joe Carter. He's four for seven with two solo homers. One of those at the expense of Steve Avery in game three at Sky Dome. The other was in game one off Tom Glavin. The infield is in for Atlanta with White at third and one out. Breaking ball in the dirt. Blocked by Barry Hill. I believe it might have said Carter's four for seven in the series. He is, of course, four for 17. And a fine play by Damon Barry Hill. You know, during the, this breaking ball, it looked like it hit the plate or right next to the plate. And Barry Hill with a nice block to save a run temporarily. And another nice play to keep White at third. Another breaking ball that was short of the plate. Two balls and no strikes. It seems that uh, managers in postseason play are more aware of playing the infield in early in the ball game. You don't often see a guy like Cito Gaston or Bobby Cox play the infield in in the first inning, but we've seen it time and time and time again in postseason play. As we said at the outset, this is still a do-or-die situation for Atlanta. They have to win this game or the season is over. The two open. Carter.
Snyder has more runs batted in than any player in baseball over the last seven years. It only has two runs batted in in this series, in large part because White and Alomar haven't been on base ahead of him. Three balls and a strike. Carter will be followed by Dave Winfield. Now the 3 1 pitch. Line toward the gap in right center. Justice on the run. Can't play it. It's off his glove and behind him. White on to score. Carter into second. And the Blue Jays lead 1 to nothing. I wonder if he lost that ball in the lights. It appeared that he was drawing a bead on it. And then at the last minute, something happened. See, I think he lost that ball in the lights. I believe the ball hit the end of his glove. And it's going to be scored a double for Joe Carter, but that ball should have, at least it could have been caught. I think he lost the ball in the lights. And they have changed the scoring to an error on Joe on Dave Justice, allowing Carter to reach second. Noted it should have been cut. So the error on the board for the Braves, the run on the board for the Blue Jays. Justice had his problems from time to time during the regular season with eight errors. Most of those errors, however, in fairness to David, came on throwing errors. A very strong throw. His first error of the World Series. Carter not charged with a time at bat. He is given credit for a sacrifice fly in an RBI. And he reaches on the air. He's at second with one out. Dave Winfield at the plate. Three and all. Winfield just one for his last ten. Has never had an extra base hit in the World Series. And he walks on four pitches. Not the worst thing that could have happened for Steve Avery with first base open already behind in the count to Winfield. Now they set up the double play possibility. Carter at second, Winfield at first. One out, one run in at the top of the first. Pitching coach Leo Mazzoni on his way to the mound, and already there is action in the Atlanta bullpen. Now Avery falls behind Joe Carter three and one and then behind Dave Winfield three and oh the early innings are not the times to pitch around hitters and the reason is you see Pete Smith up and throwing for Atlanta the reason for that is if you pitch around hitters in early innings and then you get the long ball well the big inning could get you out of the game that's why with a guy on second first base open in the first through the fifth inning usually you go after the guy. But Avery hasn't done that to Carter or Winfield. He'll work next to Candy Maldonado. Maldonado only won for 13 of the World Series, but his one hit was the game winning hit in the ninth inning of game three. Cito <laughs> Gaston decided to go with Candy Maldonado tonight instead of John Olderud at first base. Because Olerud did not have a very easy time when he faced Avery in game three. Check swing. That's a swing, says first base umpire Jerry Crawford. And the count is 0 2. Jim Cott mentioning the curveball of Steve Avery. That's one of the reasons Olerud's out of there tonight. That was a tough pitch to Maldonado, but he clearly went through. Olderwood was 0 for 3 in game 3 against Avery with two strikeouts. Softly hit toward short. Bowser to lefty for the out on Winfield, the second out of the inning. Carter takes third on the play. First and third with two down as Maldonado reaches on a fielder's choice. Fastball inside. Maldonado jammed. And Jeff Blauser and Lemke making sure of one. Now the sixth batter of the first inning, Kelly Gruber, with Toronto leading one to nothing. 
He's one for 15 in the World Series. His one hit, a home run off Steve Avery. You hear the boos for Bruder. That goes back to game two. He got the pop up for the final out of the ball game and then did the tomahawk job. The fans roar with a bit more vigor as Bruder takes the call strike one. for eight with runners in scoring position in the postseason and overall Kelly is three for 37 playoffs and World Series combined. <laughs> Two wins for the championship for the Braves one win for the Toronto Blue Jays and they lead one to nothing as they bat in the top of the first. To short, Blauser bobbles, but he covers in time to force Maldonado and end the inning. One run in the first for the Blue Jays after half an inning. Toronto one and Atlanta coming up. Center fielder Otis Nixon leads off for the Atlanta Braves tonight, batting second in left field, Deion Sanders. Terry Pendleton, the third baseman, hits third. The cleanup hitter, right fielder, David Justice. Batting fifth at first base, Sid Bream. The shortstop Jeff Blauser hits sixth. Catching and batting seventh, Damon Berryhill. The second baseman, Mark Lemke, bats eighth. And hitting ninth, the pitcher, Steve Avery. The defense for Toronto finds Count Candy Maldonado in left field. Devon White, who has made one remarkable play in this series, in center. Dave Winfield started 26 games in right field. And keep in mind that the Braves will try to run on Winfield's arm. Kelly Gruber at third base. Manuel Lee, the shortstop. Roberto Alomar at second base. And Joe Carter at first base. He has started only six games in the regular season there, but he did start one game at first base for Toronto. That was game one. Pat Borders behind the plate. 29 year old David Cohn on the mound. Acquired on August 27th from the New York Mets in exchange for Jeff Kent and Ryan Thompson. Home making his second appearance in this World Series. He had no decision in game two. The come from behind win for the Blue Jays on Ed Sprague's home run. Control trouble plagued Cohn in game two. He walked five in four in the third inning. Braves coming up for the first time tonight, trailing one to nothing. And Otis Nixon leads off. Otis six for 21 in the World Series and particularly hot of late. He's five for his last nine. He was two for four in game four and three for five in game five. And Gruber in on the grass at third, respecting the LeBuck possibility. First pitch of the night from David Cohn. Fastball high for ball one. A strike one ball and one strike on Nixon David Cohn's only loss to the Braves in this ballpark back on April 30th 1990 four and one in this park chopped to short to Manuel Lee one out one and one in the late championship series and then he worked four and a third innings in game two and walked five it is very very important for David Cohn to throw strikes he walked more this year than he ever has 111 during the regular season Deion Sanders hitting an even 500 in the World Series six for 12. Takes a strike. Leon got his first start in the World Series in Game Two because of his success against David Cohn in the past. He went one for three against Cohn in Game Two and is now seven for 12 lifetime against him. Carter waves off Cohn, two down. In the bottom of the first, the Blue Jays lead one to nothing. So David Cohn. 
staying ahead of the hitters so far. He is a very predictable pitcher in that if he's throwing strikes early, usually he sails through the middle innings. That's a, a gauge of David Cohn. So it's important for him to stay ahead early in the ball game. Terry Pendleton went to the strike over the outside part of the play. He's five for 21 in the World Series. Two of those hits came in the last game, game five. One ball and one strike. Pendleton can keep the inning alive. David Justice with bat next. One ball and two strikes. This is the 46th World Series game, postseason game rather, for Terry Pendleton, second on the all time list behind Greg Nettles. Tomahawk in the right center, that's a base hit. So the Braves have their first base runner with two outs in the bottom of the first. We have mentioned several times that Bobby Cox is amazed at how Terry Pendleton can handle the ball. Eye high or right around the shoe tops. Well, this one is eye high. Now David Justice. with his first home run of this World Series in game five off Jack Morris. He has only three hits through the first five games. Steve Avery allowed one earned run. It was an earned run charged to Avery in the top of the first. Now he's looking on as his teammates bat in the bottom of the first. With two outs and a runner at first and a fly ball in the shallow right center. Manuel Lee, the shortstop, who was shifted over to the right side of the infield, made the play to end the inning. After one, in game six, the Blue Jays lead one to nothing. Every home run hit in the series, Coke and Major League Baseball will give $5,000 to build and renovate youth baseball fields through the Coca-Cola Homers for America program. First pitch of the second, a strike to Pat Borders from Steve Avery. The Blue Jays batting with a one nothing lead. They have the bottom third of their order coming up. Orders then Lee and Cohn. Line under the glove of Jeff Lousy. With a chance to play it. But it eluded his grasp and Pat Borders continues to sizzle. He's the leading hitter in the World Series. Now eight for 17. And he's hit in 14 consecutive postseason games. The record held by Hank Bauer who hit in 17 consecutive postseason games. Ricky Henderson with 15 and 89 and 90. Brooks Robinson and Pat Borders with 14. Wow. It's distinguished company indeed mm -hmm. for Pat Borders. So for the second time in as many innings, the Blue Jays have the lead man on. Manuel Lee months foul along first. Lee just one for 15 in the World Series. And 0 for his last nine. He's only hit a fifth inning single in game two off John Smoltz. No sign of bunt that time as Lee took the ball high and tight. Through the announcement through the Coca Cola Homers for America program, and we're pleased to announce that. Coca-Cola will indeed send along a check for $20,000 as a result of the grand slam hit by Lonnie Smith in game five. And there's another grand slam in this series. Another $20,000 will go to the Homers for America program. David Justice, the catch and right for the first down to the second. I thought Manuel Lee missed a sign. 
that was a bunt sign. Big, very unusual to bunt for a pitcher coming up because, and well, it's almost like a free at bat. If you don't move the runner over, then the pitcher has a chance to bunt him over. He's hot. That's what one for 16 will do to you. David Cohn, two for two at the plate in game two. During the regular season with the Mets, he had only six hits in 65 at bats. Pretty good rip, but that one's out of play. I think we've got a sign that David Cohn thinks of himself as a hitter, perhaps even first when he appeared at the press conference yesterday with batting gloves on each hand. He likes to hit. He had two hits in game number two. He was two for two in that game. Uh, Cito Gaston saying that he could let him hit away. Deion Sanders almost on the left field line in left field. That's the second and a double play ball. Empty booted it. Blouser still manages to turn it. Four six three and that ends the inning. After an inning and a half in Atlanta, the Blue Jays won and the Braves nothing. One of the trademark calls of the late great Red Barber trailing eight to five in that game. Joe DiMaggio appeared to be tying the game for the Yankees with a long drive to left, but it was pulled back by Al, Al Gianfrido in what was to be Gianfrido's last major league game, as it turned out. Rodgers won that game eight to six to tie the series at three games apiece, and the Yankees won the series four to three. Sid Brain begins the Atlanta second. The Braves trailing one to nothing as they come to bat against David Cohn. Green, Blouser, and Berryhill to bat in the second. Green, three for 12 in the series, all three of his hits singles. He got off to a quick start in the postseason for the hot first couple of games of the playoffs against the Pirates, but he really hasn't made much noise since. He has never drunk, driven in a run in the World Series, this being his 12th game. The all-time record for World Series starts from the start of a career without an RBI, shared by a couple of Hall of Famers. It's 13 World Series starts without an RBI. So Louis Alfred Chick Hafey, Yankees pitcher Whitey Ford. 13 World Series games from the start of their careers without an RBI. The ball and two strikes on Breen. Two balls and two strikes. David Cohn with a 2.83 earned run average this year, his best since 1988, when he was 20 and three. You may remember that year that the Mets won the Eastern Division of the National League. David Cohn was slated to pitch Game Two against the Dodgers. He had conspired with a writer for the New York Daily News to write an article every day. He wrote that article. It had some disparaging views of the Dodgers. They didn't take too kindly to it, and they beat David Cohn in game two. And I'll tell you, I remember seeing him before that game, and he was visibly upset. And he has admitted that it was a mistake to come out with, with that article. You wonder why players allow themselves to get into those situations in the postseason. Certainly they don't need the money to do guest columns or extra radio shows or television shows. But in this series, we've seen an example of it. David Justice on Thursday morning before game five said that he thought his teammates were flat in game four, had the atmosphere of a spring training game. And Bobby Cox said that's a lot of baloney. And Many of Justice's teammates were upset as well. That's ball four. Green battled all the way back from 0-2 to work home for the first walk of the night thrown by the Toronto right-hander. We mentioned 111 walks for David Cohn. And prior to this year, from 1986 to 1991, he had walked 3.1 batters per nine innings. And in 1992, it was up almost a run a walk a game. Postseason plays averaged five and a half per nine innings. Lead man on for Atlanta in the second. The Blue Jays lead one to nothing. Jack Blauser took the ball all over the way. Blauser is three for 19 in the series. All three of his hits singles. Field 
corner, into the corner, and up against the retaining wall. Maldonado couldn't play it. It was touched by a fan and then dropped down onto the playing field. A foul ball. Blauser has just one hit in his last 12 at bats with runners on base. He is awfully quick inside. He has very, very quick hands. The home run that he hit against Pittsburgh was an inside fastball by Doug Drabeck. I don't think Cohn intended for that fastball to be inside, but it was. Blauser turned up. by Maldonado. Green stops at second. First and second and nobody out as Jeff Blauser delivers his fourth hit of the World Series. And that's another example of those quick hands. I mean he turned on the fastball. That was an identical pitch as the one that he fouled off. Lightning fast. That describes his hands and also the speed with which the ball went out to left. That was well struck by Blauser. Two hits tonight for Atlanta. And now Damon Berryhill, who's one for his last 15, two for 18 overall with 10 strikeouts. He is approaching the World Series record for strikeouts in a single series. Gruber in at third and Carter in at first base. You have Lemke and Avery coming up. Now Avery's a pretty good hitter. I don't think Bobby Cox is going to be bunting in this situation. Barry Hill did not have a sacrifice bunt during the regular season, nor does he have one in the postseason. That's why well hit the center field. Devon White spinning back to the warning track to make the catch. Green tags and heads to third. Lowser remains at first. Barry Hill hit it a long way, but at the deepest part of the ballpark, it's 4-0-2 to straightaway center. First and third with one down for Atlanta in the second. Damon Barry Hill's first major league home run was off of David Cohn, and he sends Devon White back to the middle of the warning track to make this catch. And he had a side view of Greg Olson rubbing his cast. We mentioned on our last broadcast. And he had had that cast removed last Monday. It has been their lucky cast so far. Now Mark Lemke. Four for 17 in the series, but he had two hits in game five. The tying run at third base with one out. One nothing Toronto in the second. Sid Green is the runner at third. Jeff Blauser at first. in scoring position is Mark Lemke. The 0-1 pin. Fly ball, not particularly deep in left center. White makes the catch. Green won't try. He started down the line and then wisely thought better of it as White's throw was right on the money to the cutoff man Carter and with plenty on it. Well if that ball was hit just a bit deeper I think Green tries it. Devon White setting up in perfect position to throw and he makes a good throw but with the pitcher coming up next I think a runner in third would have taken a chance had the ball been hit just a tad deeper. Pitcher Avery with first and third and two down. In the second, the Blue Jays lead one to nothing. Had Borders going through the signs about what the Blue Jays will do should Blauser take off for second base.
Late swing and one strike on Avery who hit 171 during the regular season. He's not been to the plate in this World Series. His one start prior to tonight against Toronto was in game three of the Sky Dome where they used the DH. strikes out and that ends the inning. The Braves threaten but do not score. And after two, it's Toronto one and Atlanta nothing. CBS Sports coverage of Game 6 of the 1992 World Series is brought to you by Bram Stoker's Dracula, a new film from Columbia Pictures. Coca-Cola Classic, the official soft drink of Major League Baseball, can't beat the real thing. And by your Toyota dealer who invites you to discover the all-new Corolla. Discover Corolla again. Welcome back to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium for game six of the 1992 World Series. The Toronto Blue Jays lead this game one to nothing. They lead the series three games to two. The top of the order in the third for the Blue Jays. Devon White. He took the second pitch of the ball game into left field for a base hit. He stole second and scored the only run of this game. On a sacrifice fly by Joe Carter. Carter will hit third in this inning. Roberto Alomar between Carter and White. Steve Avery's 0-1 pitch. White tried to bunt and missed it. Devon White, very hot in the American League Championship Series, batting 348. He, along with Alomar, combined for a 388 average, but his World Series numbers are down. And he strikes out on three pitches. Barry Hill has to throw down the first for the put out. One out in the third. That's the first strikeout of the night for Steve Avery. At curveball and a nice block by Barry Hill. As White goes too far, the ball trickles out in front of home, and Barry Hill throws him out. Now Roberto Alomar, two for 19 in the series with his 0 for 1 tonight. Alomar has had particular trouble from the right side of the plate against the Braves left-handers. He's now 1 for 13, and he has been bothered by a sore left elbow and wrist. There is elbow sliding in the home on the play. In game two, in which John Smoltz tagged him, Alomar appeared to be safe and was called out. He was also hit by a pitch on the wrist. And he's sore. That's to right and toward the gap and in for a hit. Justice over to cut it off, holding Alomar to a long single. So Roberto breaks an 0 for 7 drought with a one out base hit here in the third. You look up and down both lineups. And you see some very paltry averages of all the hitters. Only Pat Borders is hitting over 235 in the Toronto lineup. They carried a 204 team average coming in. Now Joe Carter, who knocked in the only run of this game with a sacrifice fly to right, he wound up reaching when David Justice couldn't snare the fly ball and was charged with an error. Alomar off with the first pitch. He'll steal it without a throw. Avery with the slow move to the plate and an off speed pitch. And Alomar is three for three in stolen bases in the World Series. Once again, the high leg kick. Watch Avery with that high power pitcher's leg kick and Alomar stealing second without a throw. He has stolen third base once in this series, 12 times during the regular season, so he may not be through running yet. 
10 for 10 in his career in the postseason, 8 for 8 this year. Carter to the right side. Another good piece of hitting by a Blue Jay hitter. This not as admirable because there was one out. But it did appear that Carter was trying to shoot that through the hole that he had on the right side. Alomar third with two down for Dave Winfield, who walked his first time up. One nothing Toronto. The Blue Jays batting in the third. Toronto started the night hitting just 204 as a team through the first five games of the World Series. They already have three hits off Avery. Good off speed breaking ball. Winfield was out ahead of it. Fly ball should be handled with ease by Justice. And it is. The Blue Jays strand a runner at third. We'll return to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium after this word from your local station. Welcome back to Atlanta where the Blue Jays lead one to nothing as we head to the bottom of the third. As Pat O'Brien told you at the outset, the last five teams that have held a three games to two World Series lead have all lost the World Series. Each of them has lost the final two games on the road. 1982, St. Louis came back to defeat Milwaukee. In 1985, it was Kansas City over St. Louis. In 86, the Mets over Boston. In 87, Minnesota over St. Louis. And last year, Minnesota went home and won the final two to beat Atlanta. And at 2 a.m. tomorrow morning, we have to turn back the clock, and that's what the Braves want to do. Turn back the clock and do what Minnesota did to them last year. Winning the final games at the Metrodome. Now Otis Nixon, the top of the order in the third for Atlanta. Nixon bounced to shoot his first time up. He slaps that one out of play. One fact working in the Blue Jays' favor as they try to overcome that recent history is that not once all year have the Blue Jays visited a city and left without winning at least one game there. They were not swept in any series this year during the regular season. They were the first team in 49 years to do that. Of course, they won one of the two in the first two games of the World Series here in Atlanta. One and one on Nixon. Something has to give because the last five World Series champions have all had the home field advantage in the playoffs and the World Series. And on this year belongs to the Atlanta Braves. Two balls and a strike on Nixon, then Deion Sanders and Terry Pendleton. The Braves threatened but did not score last inning. They got the first two men on. But they stranded Bream and Blauser. When Otis Nixon leads off an inning for the Braves, he's their most important guy in the lineup. He's not with two outs and a runner in scoring position. Chopped up the middle and Lee has played his left for the first out of the inning. He is similar to Devon White or Roberto Alomar with Toronto. So it's very, very important to get the first guy, especially when it's Otis Nixon. Nice play by Manuel Lou. Now Deion Sanders, who bounced to the first baseman Carter and assisted his first time up. Sanders. Nixon the first out of the third. The Blue Jays lead one to nothing. Leon has been sniping off and on at Braves general manager John Schurholz. Schurholz was the first to say yesterday that you can see the excitement level of the Braves ball club rise when Sanders is in there. That's what gave Dion his first opportunity to play because David Cohn 
was pitching. He almost hit a ball out of the ballpark. His first start in the World Series. That was game two. That was after not starting a league championship series game. And when he did play, he wasn't very impressive in the league championship against Pittsburgh. 0 for 5 with three strikeouts. But he's turned all that around in the World Series. So the Braves win this. He got to be sort of the leading contender for MVP on it. Two balls and two strikes. Leon not playing football during the World Series, but that didn't stop him from undertaking another task yesterday. He spent the day between games in Tallahassee at the opening of the Friends Rib Restaurant. Well hit down the line off the blow of Joe Carter. That's a fair ball, and there's a lot of room in foul ground. Sanders on his way to second, and that's as far as he'll get with one out. Toronto loses something with defense with Carter at first base. We mentioned only six starts. I'm not saying John Holerud would get that ball, but it's off the glove of uh, Joe Carter. That hop coming up, hitting on the thumb of the first baseman's mitt, and a nice play by Alomar to retrieve it in time to hold Sanders to second base. It has been scored a double, the third Atlanta hit of the night. The hits are even at three apiece. Toronto leads one to nothing in the third. Terry Pendleton singled his first time up. Breaking ball inside, one and all on Pendleton. Contributes 
the lip. It's a lot of weight around Neon's neck to carry around his his way around the base pads. Well, he does a hamper of speed. A double, a stolen base, and a sacrifice fly by Pendleton. Another dangerous situation for Cohen. A 3 0 count now to David Justice. With Green on deck. Justice had the green light and sliced it foul. Here's Sid Bream. 1 1 the score in the bottom of the third. This is game six of the 1992 World Series. The Toronto Blue Jays wrap it up with a win tonight. And ties it with Henry Aaron. Braves postseason home run record. Justice hit his sixth postseason home run in game five in his 26th postseason game. Aaron had six postseason homers in 17 games. 57 58 before late championship series play in 1969 against the Mets. Cole has battled from 3 0 to 3 and 2. And the ball pitch is a breaking ball that throws Justice for the final out of the inning. Second strikeout of the night for Cole. The Braves with one run in the third to tie it. After three, one run to score. This game summary is sponsored by Budweiser. The Blue Jays scored first in the first. Joe Carter has sacrificed fly scoring Devon White. The Braves tied it in the third. First pitch of the fourth, the ball to Candy Maldonado. Maldonado with a high fly ball to deep left field. Sanders back to the warning track to the wall. It's a home run. Just the second hit of the World Series for Candy Maldonado, but both have been big. And they love it at the Sky Dome, where they're watching on the Jumbotron scoreboard. First home run of the World Series for Maldonado makes it two to one Blue Jays. And before that home run, he was 0 for his last 11 in postseason play against left-handed pitching. That old saying in baseball, he doesn't get many hits, but they're all big ones, applies to Maldonado. And it has applied to the man at the plate as well in the postseason, Kelly Gruber. Maldonado's only other hit, I mentioned earlier, the game winning single in the ninth inning of game three off Jeff Reardon that brought in Roberto Alomar with the winning run. Two for 15 in the series. That was the 16th home run of the postseason for the Toronto Blue Jays. Ties a record shared by the 1970 Orioles and the 1989 Athletics. Ruber to short. Wiser. Gruber by a running step. One out in the fourth. 2 1 Toronto. Our blimp tonight is Goodyear Stars and Stripes from Pompano Beach, Florida. And at the controls is Captain Drew Marshall from Fort Lauderdale. Single to left, his eighth hit of the World Series in the second. And by the way, the third home run the Blue Jays have hit off Steve Avery. All solo shots. And coming into the World Series, Avery had given up only one home run over his last 37 and a third postseason inning. He's given up three and over 11 in this World Series. <laughs> home runs in game three off Avery by Carter and Gruber. And despite the two long balls, Avery said after the game, I pitched about as well as I can pitch. He's on the short end of a two to one score at the moment. Down the line, Pendleton couldn't run it. Borders rounds first. He'll try for two. Sanders with the throw over the head of Lemke and backed up by Bream. To keep Borders at second. We'll wait 
for the scoring, but in all likelihood, that is another hit for Pat Borders. It is a double, his ninth hit of the series. Breaking ball hit off the heel of the glove of Terry Pendleton. Well, the Atlanta Braves just cannot get Pat Borders out in this series. He is sizzling. Indeed he is. Started his professional career as a first baseman and third baseman. But he didn't have the power to play those positions in the major leagues or the ability defensively. Well, he was going to get released in 1986. Remember Bobby Maddock of the Blue Jays organization he said, I'd like to become a catcher. Good thing he did. He made 41 errors as a third baseman one year. That will drive you out of that position. Manuel Lee out on the fly ball to right in the second. He's batting with Borders at second and one out here in the fourth. Toronto has reclaimed the lead on the home run by Maldonado here in the fourth. And unless you were Evelyn Wood, you probably didn't have a chance to digest the entire Budweiser game summary. The Atlanta run came in the third. Deion Sanders doubled, stole third, and scored on the sacrifice fly by Terry Pendleton. Strike. And with two hits in the inning, Pete Smith is up for the second time tonight in the Atlanta bullpen. He started warming up in the first inning when the Blue Jays sent six men to the plate. Last ball miss. Lee ahead with three balls in the strike with the pitcher David Cohn waiting in the on deck circle. Borders at second, one out. One run in here in the fourth for the Blue Jays. They lead two to one. Payoff pitch to Lee. Jack swing, strike three, says John Shula. And Lee is 0 for his last 11. That is a big strikeout right there. If Manuel Lee gets on, if he walks, then you have Cone bunt them over. And Steve Avery is in a mess of trouble. Big pitch mm -hmm. for Avery. Lee now one for his last 17. Those were his numbers for the entire series. As you check other numbers from the sports world today. David Cohn laid off the breaking ball. Cohn bounced into a 4-6-3 twin killing. That ended the second. Just is very, very deep in right field. The other two Atlanta outfielders, Otis Nixon in center and Sanders, properly planned, but just is way too deep against a le left hander like Avery. We talked about the difficulty sometimes for pitchers to throw strikes to pitchers at the plate. And that's the problem confronting Avery at the moment. You saw how shallow Nixon and Sanders were in left and center. Go way over toward left. Sanders almost on the Cohn walks on four pitches. Down to Cox after a conversation with pitching coach Leo Mazzoni on his way to the mound. Von White will be the next hitter for Toronto. Bobby Cox doesn't go to the mound unless he's going to make a move. I think the first thing he said to Steve Avery, are you all right? You may have noticed something. Delivery. A lot of managers will say that, are you all right? It's very common, but it would seem like Cox asked Avery that in a 
bit different manner then. Fox tried to relax last night by spending time at his farm in North Georgia, about 50 miles from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Devon White, the batter, singled and scored in the first, struck out in the third. He's up there with runners at first and second and two down in the fourth. The Blue Jays have scored in this inning on a home run by Maldonado to reclaim the lead. It's two to one Toronto. The runner at second is Pat Borders at first, David Cole. The one over. Line to left to hit. Sanders plays it. Borders being waved in. The throw to the plate, and here it is. Out of home. Sanders' throw was right on the money to cut down the runner and end the inning. The ball was hit hard. Sanders charges it. Borders is not a fast runner. And you see Berryhill off with the mask and a quick tag nails his counterpart. On a play at the plate, once a catcher catches the ball, his best weapon to ward off the runner is his left shin guard. Watch how Berryhill uses that to spin borders out of there. He never reached the plate. So it's only a two to one lead for Toronto as the Atlanta Braves get ready to come to bat in the bottom of the fourth inning. Sid Green will lead off against David Cole. Green walked his first time up. Jeff Blauser to follow and then Damon Berryhill. That is five, six, and seven due for Atlanta. Ball swinging, and it's a fly to shallow left for Maldonado. Tomorrow on the NFL Today, Terry on the grounding of the Eagles' offense. Wesley on the Vikings' new Pearson Pison. Plus the man who is the Cowboys back on top, Jimmy Johnson. It's all tomorrow at 12:30 Eastern on the NFL Today. The last word before kickoff. Washington at Minnesota. Our feature game at one o'clock. And Jeff Blauser looked at a strike. He singled to left. Back in the second. Short swing. He peeled down to first. It was not a swing, says Jerry Crawford. You may remember the last time up, David Cohn tried to come inside twice to Blauser. He has stayed away with the first. One hop throw, blocked by Carter for the out. Oh man! What a play! Wow! In game two, Alomar made a terrific play with a runner on second and two outs to save a run, and he saves a runner here. Well, that is a, just an absolutely brilliant play by Roberto Alomar. He won the gold glove last year. He can just about book it that he'll win it this year and many more times in his career. Damon Berryhill looked at a strike. He was out on the fly ball to center his first time up. He's down two for 19 in the series. One for his last 16. And as we mentioned during Damon's first at bat, he is approaching the most strikeouts by a player in a World Series. The record is 12, set by Willie Wilson in 1980. Willie Wilson made the last out in that World Series in the six game series. High fastball from Tug McGraw to give Philadelphia their only world championship. <laughs> and that's strikeout number 11 for Damon Berryhill. The Braves go in order in the fourth. After four, the Blue Jays two, the Braves one. Another World Series moment from 1975.
Great call by a great broadcaster, Ned Martin, with Carlton Fisk's 12th inning home run in Game 6 of the 75 World Series. It gave the Red Sox the win and forced to Game 7. Game 7 that year, of course, won by Cincinnati. One young man who undoubtedly was devastated as he was growing up in suburban Boston at that time. About the result of that game, the new pitcher on the mound for the Atlanta Braves, Burlington, Massachusetts native Pete Smith. Pete's 7 0 for the Braves this year. That's in the National League Championship Series. He did work two games against the Pirates. This is his first World Series appearance. Following four innings by Steve Avery. Roberto Alomar on the bounding ball to second. He's one for three. If you're just joining us, Toronto leads two to one after four innings. They scored in the first. Devon White started the ball game with a single, stole second, took third in the ground out, scored in a sacrifice fly by Joe Carter. Atlanta tied it up. Deion Sanders a double. He stole third, scored in a Terry Pendleton sacrifice fly. And Andy Maldonado put Toronto back on top with the leadoff home run off Avery in the fourth. Interesting that Avery was yanked after four innings. The pitcher is scheduled to bat second. When the Braves come up in the bottom of this particular. I think Bobby Cox, with everybody available for the most part, all of his pitchers. That is a fair ball. Top spin line drive down the left field line for Joe Carter. Sanders juggled it once on the bullpen mound, and it didn't matter. It was going to be a double all the way for Carter. His first hit of the night and fifth of the series. A breaking ball to Carter. That he hammers down the left field line just fair. May have hit the line. Nope, just fair. About four inches. But I think Bobby Cox's thinking on this was to just get Pete Smith through this inning. And then go to another reliever. In the sixth inning, mm -hmm. the whole staff is available tonight, with the exception of Tommy Glavin. Possibly John Smoltz. Possibly. Smith brought in particularly with Carter and Winfield, the big right handed guns in mind. Carter got to him for the double. Now here's Winfield who walked and fly to right against Avery. Blue Jays already with seven hits. Winfield looked at a Smith fastball for strike one. Of course, much of the reason for the low batting average for Dave Winfield in the World Series came in. It was only World Series prior to this year. One for 22 was Winfield in the Fall Classic of 1981. Oh, a lot better this year. He's four for 18 now. And one for his last 11. That one for seven, it's just a two to one lead for Toronto. They could be much more comfortably ahead at the moment. Well, Deion Sanders has had a lot to say about this game so far. The assist, throwing out Pat Borders at the plate, and he doubled, stole a base, and scored the only run of the game for the Braves. The two on the windfield. Dropped by Barry Hill. It's a ball. Three and one. It was a close pitch, but when the catcher doesn't squeeze it, that reduces the likelihood you're going to get a strike ball. Right. You see Barry Hill with his head twisted around. Talked with home plate umpire John Shulock about it. Smith has thrown a couple of pitches to Winfield in this sequence when the second baseman Lemke was just about standing on second base. Trying to keep Carter close. That time he stepped off as Lemke moved to the back. Full count now. There was another time right there. Mark Lemke going over. Joe Carter taking his lead. And the whole right side was open. Dave Winfield hits a lot of balls to the right side too.
Now the payoff pitch. Oh, Infield just got a piece of that one off the end of the bat. Three balls and two strikes, one out. Carter, the runner at second. We're in the top of the fifth. The Blue Jays lead two to one. If Toronto wins tonight, they are baseball's world champions in 1992. Carter taking off the third as Winfield sends it right back here. I got you up, didn't I? It did indeed. Mm -hmm. I was ready for it, though. That was a harmless fly. I usually it said was harmless. it didn't clang off my hand. Yeah, it was harmless because it went above us, not in rattling around in the booth here. <laughs> he had Buzz Hannon ready to make the play. Happy birthday to Buzz, by the way. Those are the buzzwords today. Happy birthday. <laughs> Into left center on the run. Nixon made the catch. Carter a long way toward third, but he'll get back. Nixon had to take a couple of steps to get his balance back after having the long run to make the nice running catch in the gap. When that appeared to be ticketed for Dave Winfield's first ever World Series extra base hit. We have had a chance to see two center fielders who are among the best in baseball. Otis Nixon covering a lot of ground to make that catch. Nixon, by the way, led all major league outfielders with averaging three putouts a game. Gives you an idea of how the Atlanta pitchers pitch also. A lot of fly ball pitchers. A lot of guys who throw high fastballs, and it's very difficult to put the ball in play on the ground against the Atlanta staff. Very difficult to catch the ball. Candy Maldonado hit his last time up. It was back into the bleachers and left field. It was the difference in the ball game. At the moment, it is a leadoff home run by Maldonado in the fourth. Broke a one-one tie, made it two to one Toronto. It's still two to one with Maldonado at the plate in the fifth. Carter at second and two down. Slowly to short. Lousy. Throws him out, and Pete Smith survives the fifth unscathed. The Braves dodge another bullet. Halfway through game six, Toronto two, Atlanta one. Steve Avery was removed from the game after pitching four innings, and part of the reason might have been that in the first inning he had like a little splinter underneath that thumbnail that was bothering him, and I think it particularly affected the grip of his curveball because he didn't have as good a command of that tonight. So I think it was a reason of that, although he told Bobby Cox after the first inning it was okay, but that plus the Blue Jays right hand hitters. Force Bobby Cox to make that move a little sooner than he normally would. And he'll pinch hit for Pete Smith in all likelihood here in the game. Mark Lemke fouled the first pitch of the fifth inning away for strike one. Lemke out on a fly ball to center field his first time up. Pete Smith is in the on deck circle at the moment, but during the break between innings, we saw Lonnie Smith. With a bat in his hand. Otis Nixon will bat third here in the fifth inning. Blue Jays lead two to one. They've out hit Atlanta seven to three. Bobby Cox is thinking about a pinch hitter. I don't think you'll use Lonnie Smith here in the fifth unless Lenke's on base. With one out, nobody on. I don't think you want your best pinch hitter hitting in that situation. Two balls and a strike on Lemke. There is action in the Atlanta bullpen. Charlie Liebrand is warming up. So if they do hit the Pete Smith, Liebrand will be the Atlanta pitcher when we go to the sixth inning. The last couple haven't been close from home. Three balls and a strike. David Cohn pitched only eight games for the Blue Jays during the regular season. His 3 1 pitch is ball four. And now, because it's a bunting situation, they're not going to hit for Pete Smith. Glenn 
Kaminsky at first. That's just the second walk issued by Cohn tonight. And here is Pete Smith. Smith is not a good hitter. He is one for 26 during the regular season. He sacrificed three times. Gruber is almost on top of him. Smith took a fastball for a strike. You want to bunt the ball to Joe Carter. Joe Carter is not adept at playing first base. He has a strong throwing arm, but he's not a regular first baseman. Bunt the ball, you want to bunt it to first. Plus, Kelly Gruber, the third baseman, is about 40 feet away. Gruber already creeping in as Smith takes a ball low and away. One ball and one strike. The field down to first. It was not a potential bunt by Smith. Jimmy Williams, the third base coach, through the signs for both Lemke and Smith. Mounted foul, now it's one and two. So might Bobby Cox be guilty of trying to get a little bit too much out of Pete Smith. You mentioned the rest of pitching staff. Now you're in a situation where if he fails to bunt, he has to go up there and hit. Where if a treadway failed to get the job done with the bunt, he'd be at least more likely to deliver it. Yeah, he has uh, two ways to go. He elected to go with Smith, and uh, it is a problem with the count one and two. You are wasting uh, an out. The one thing you want to do is keep in mind is if Lemke as the runner at first base, Joe Carter, if he breaks too soon, try to steal second base. Lemke has no stolen bases this year, regular season or postseason. So that's why Cohn threw over there then. That throw to first base is to hold the runner. But Joe Carter, we mentioned, not a lot of experience at first base. If he breaks too soon, you go as far as he does. And by the time Cohn releases the ball, you could possibly steal a base. Smith turns the bunt with two strikes and fouled it off. He's out. So that's a strikeout. The first out of the inning. And the bullpen is silent, so Pete Smith will go back out to pitch in the sixth inning. Bobby Cox had other options available to him. Because it was a fun situation, but then for the lead man on to let Smith on him over. He couldn't get the job done. Well, the runner is at first with one out, throw to Nixon, who was twice passed to short. Well, there's some things in baseball that are blatantly wrong. I can't see where that's blatantly wrong one way or the other. It's up to Pete Smith to get the bunt down. You gotta, you gotta execute. Nixon slaps it foul. Yeah, going one way or the other, it, do, it doesn't matter whether in that situation, I don't think, whether you bunt or not. I mean, Pete Smith, a very capable pitcher, strong toward the end of the season. I think uh, the decision was wrong, but the, ex the, the decision was right, the execution was wrong. to Nixon. Just missed. The Blue Jays lead two to one. The Braves batting in the bottom of the fifth. This is game six of the 1992 World Series. The Blue Jays win tonight. They are the world champions. The Braves win game seven. It is tomorrow night here at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Good throw. Lemke just back ahead of the tag from Carter. Pop 
picked up along the line. Lee drifts over and makes the catch. They say he was in fair territory. That's the second out of the inning. The Goodyear Blitz Stars and Stripes is high over the night. Stars and Stripes is the most recent addition to the fleet, continuing the tradition since 1926. John McDonough with Tim McCarver, Jim Codd, and Pat O'Brien. Delighted to have you with us from Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Sanders is at the plate. They're certainly playing Sanders to pull in the infield. Roberto Alomar, the second baseman, almost shake hands with Joe Carter, and he's on the edge of the outfield grass. Braves with their first two hitters, it's very, very difficult to defense Otis Nixon and Deion Sanders. They spray the ball around. But obviously, the scouting reports have shown that he pulls the ball on the ground. Deion has done that twice tonight. Once for an out to the first base, and for a double off the glove of Joe Carter that continues down the right field line. Cone ahead of Sanders 0-2. Throwing 71 pitches tonight. A bit better ratio balls for strikes tonight than for David in game two of the World Series. And he threw 46 balls and 47 strikes. As he walked five in that outing over four and a third innings. David Cohn had a start this year with the New York Mets where he threw 166 pitches. His next start, he threw 133. 300 pitches, right about 300 pitches, and two starts, leading the major leagues in strikeouts for the third consecutive year. He's ahead of Sanders, one and two. He is not on the run. Leon slaps it back to the screen. mentioned that Cohn only started eight games for the Blue Jays during the regular season. If he is the winning pitcher tonight, he would become the first pitcher ever to win the final game of a World Series for a team for which he had pitched fewer than 10 regular season games. Rent a pitcher indeed. David has called himself the rent a pitcher, the hired gun. The middle of him. Lemke will continue on toward third and get there without a throw. Deion Sanders continues to be a major player in the 1992 World Series. He's two for three tonight. Now nine for 14 lifetime against David Cohn. This is only his fourth start, and he's been on base ten times. This ball right back under the glove of David Cohn. And we mentioned that Alomar, the top of your screen there, playing him to pull. Lemke moving to third easily. The sign is true. They can't get Dion out. Two for three tonight is Dion. He's eight for 15 in the World Series. He's at first. Lemke at third with two down. And the whole half of the fifth. The Blue Jays lead two to one. One thing uh, that was important on that play, Mark Lemke going to third base, that clears second and gives Sanders a chance to steal a base. He already has one stolen base. Usually uh, better not to try to go to third with two outs unless you're sure. But it was a big play possible in this situation. Hamilton with the ball low and in. There he's working on a perfect night. He's singled in the first inning. Over the sacrifice fly in the third that brought in Sanders with the only Atlanta run of this game. Time called. Borders and Cohn will be joined in the mound by pitching coach Galen Sisko. And there is action for the first time tonight in the Jays' bullpen. Todd Stottlemyre is the right hander, David Wells the left.
has had to sign 100 dozen baseballs over the course of this World Series. He said he wanted to sign as many as he could tonight because he doesn't plan on being back here tomorrow night to sign any more. Six base runners through five innings. They've had a man thrown out at the plate. They've been into a double play. And the Atlanta Braves just left two more in scoring position. They've left five on base at all tonight. Of course, you need uh, the two out base hit. I think the big scoring opportunity for Atlanta was the second inning. That's when Green led off of the wall. Blauser led off of the base hit. Runners at first and second. They played at no one. It's only been one perfect inning worked by a pitcher in this ball game. That was Cone in the fourth, and he needed a big play by Alamo on the ground ball at the middle hit by Blauser to have a one, two, three in. One and two, the count on Gruber. Over the last couple of years for the Atlanta Braves. So 
much so that Pete Smith recalls when he made his major league debut here at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium in 1987. There were 2,400 people in the stands. That's well hit down the left field line, but Sanders has room at the 3.30 mark in the corner. Ruber now 0 for 3 tonight, 1 for 18 in the series. He's the first out of the sixth inning. Pat Borders is singled and doubled, two for two tonight. It's particularly impressive what Borders has been able to do in this series, given that the men around him haven't hit at all. Kelly Gruber and Manuel Lee have combined two for 35. Borders is between the two. Also, uh, when you consider the fact that Borders caught 137 games this year, the most of any catcher in the American League. Smith has jumped ahead of him, one ball and two strikes. One out, sixth inning, two to one Toronto. Game six of the World Series. Blue Jays lead the best of seven series, three to two. Pitch the fastball just off the plate. And the breaking ball is just off the plate as well. Duncan Ward groans through the assembled masses. Now the 3 2 pitch. Fastball popped it up. Green and Barry Hill with room. It's green for the second up. Manuel Lee over two tonight, one for 17 in the series. Fly to right in the second. Looked at a called third strike in the fourth. Facing Pete Smith for the first time tonight. Line down the right field line, a fair ball, and a base hit for Lee. Just his second of the series, he slips down, but the throw went to second. And he's back to first with two down. That's the eighth Toronto hit of the ball game. You might think, well, that's just an insignificant hit. Well, it's not. With two out and nobody on, a base hit will clear the pitcher, David Cohn in this case, and the leadoff batter, Devon White, will lead off the seventh inning. That is provided that Cohn doesn't get on. That's why Manuel Lee plays it safe and goes back to first. He needs new breaks. David Cole bounced through a double play in the second, walked in the fourth. Late swing and foul out of play. David Cole honed his hitting skills in his backyard. Kansas City is a youngster. He and his brother put up lights. In their backyard, so they could play wiffle ball at Coneway Park. A lot of David's pitches look like pitches you see in wiffle ball, with the ball dancing all over the place. Pete Smith thrown to first base. It is remote that Manuel Lee will try to steal a base if he's thrown out. Now you lose the value of the two-out base hit, and David Cone would lead off in the seventh inning. Either he or a pinch hitter. See, Smith's dividing his attention to first base. He need not do that in this situation. Smith, when he was drafted by Philadelphia originally, a very hard thrower. He says he remembers games early in Smith's major league career when he struck out 12. Since arm troubles 
started to play him. He doesn't throw quite as hard, but he's been effective. That's for sure. Cole is out on the ground ball. That ends the inning. Bottom of the sixth upcoming at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. The Blue Jays two and the Braves one. This World Series moment, game six, 1986. Little roller up along first. Behind the back. Mookie Wilson with the ground ball through the legs of Bill Buckner, allowing Ray Knight to score. As the Mets came from behind to win game six, forcing a game seven, which New York also won. In that inning, two outs and nobody on, and the Mets trailing by two runs, and remarkably, they won it. David Justice over two tonight. He has popped the short and struck out, facing David Cohn, who's gone all the way for Toronto. Cohn pitching with a two to one lead in the bottom of the six. Justice, then Bream and Blauser. It is four, five, and six coming up for Atlanta. Braves have had at least one base runner in every inning except the fourth. They've only scored once, and that was in the third. Ball to strike on Justice. Hits to right field this year, only 22 to the left side, 17 to center field. You could be a pull hitter and not hit the ball on the ground, but the thing about Justice, he pulls the ball on the ground. The Borders points at the base umpires at the slightest flinch by the hitter. That time, Justice moved ever so slightly, and Borders was pointing down to third. And she left. Throws to ignore it. And the count is full on the leadoff hitter in the sixth inning. We fought it off. It's still three and two. As you mentioned Justice was in the middle of this alleged dissension on the Braves ball club. It's been much chronicled in the Atlanta papers the last couple of days. Bobby Cox said before the game, there's nothing to it. He thinks his team is one harmonious lot. Mayon pitch again, well hit to right. Winfield makes the play. Justice out on the line drive for the first out of the inning. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. When you think about it, who says you have to have harmony to win? You look at the Oakland Athletics back in 1972, 73, 74. Three consecutive world championships. It fights all the time. The man of the plate said Brave is one who's quote is saying he agreed with what David Justice said. But the Braves played it by being four. He thought they were flat too. There have been reports that Justice and Deion Sanders have been feuding. The relationship was cool after Sanders splashed Justice's fiance with water in the championship game, the seventh game of the National League Championship Series against Pittsburgh. Cole's 1 1 pitch to Bream. Inside, two balls and a strike. Sid has walked and fly to left enough. Walks. Ball four, apparently low. Green walks for the second time. 
Bowen has had much better control tonight. That's only the third free pass that he has issued. John Sullivan, the bullpen coach, getting off the phone. There will be action out there in a moment. Jeff Blauser. One for two. He should be two for two. Single to the second. Last time up, he had a smash up the middle, and Roberto Alomar made a great diving play going to his right. And he threw Blauser out. Breaking ball to miss. The most important thing for the Braves tonight as they go to the plate is to make home throw strikes. Usually, in the words of Fox, that slider is not a strike. Be patient at the plate and be aggressive on the bases. A strike one and one the count the action in the Toronto bullpen is the duo that was up earlier the right hander Todd Stottlemyre and the lefty David Wells one out a runner at first sixth inning Toronto leads two to one again borders pointed down at first again Jerry Crawford said no swing the count is two balls and a strike Three straight sliders to Jeff Blauser. He has had two very dangerous at bats against Cohen. And obviously, he is picking him up very, very well tonight. Even his foul balls have been hit hard. Cohen has gone to three balls with the last three hitters. He's two and one on Blauser and in with a strike. Among those in attendance tonight, the boxer of Andrew Holyfield. Here, despite the protests of his trainers, he's been in Houston working out for his upcoming fight against Riddick Bull, but he's been flying back and forth to see the Braves games in the postseason. He's from Atlanta. The 2 2 is a fly ball toward the Braves bullpen. A long run for Winfield, but he can't get there. tonight for David Cohn. That is the slider. You see that tightly wrapped pitch that gets Jeff Blauser right on the corner. Could have been just out of the strike zone, but a tough pitch to take with two strikes. Two outs in the sixth inning. Two to one Toronto. Sid Bream aboard at first for Damon Berryhill. Berryhill's over two. He has flied to center and struck out. Strikes out again. He will tie the World Series record for strikeouts in the series. Big swing and a miss. One and one. For 34 from the left side of the plate is Damon Berryhill. And that run, of course, was the game winner in game one off Jack Morris in the sixth inning. Reminded Atlanta with all of its runs in their three to one win. Fastball straightened him up. Two balls in a strike. Yeah. 
This could well be David Cohn's last game in a Toronto Blue Jays uniform. He's a free agent at the end of the year. A lot of speculation that he might go back to New York as a member of the Yankees. Jerry was playing time in New York. Barry Hill with a pop up. Lee out. Maldonado in. It's Lee making the play. That certainly caused an anxious moment or two for folks throughout Canada. We head to the seventh. Still two to one Toronto. CBS Sports coverage of Game 6 of the 1992 World Series is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. The trucks you can depend on. The trucks that last. Miller Lite. It's everything you want a beer to be. And by Burger King, where you can get it your way, right away, at Burger King now. This city named Atlanta back in, in 1845, but nine years before that, the name of this city was Terminus Georgia and the Braves are hoping that their World Series dreams are not terminated this evening mm -hmm. in the interest of equal time in this political season the name Toronto is the Huron language it means meeting place on a great lake Devon White to right field and David Justice one pitch and one out for Pete Smith in the top of the seventh Blue Jays can terminate the Atlanta season and their own become world champions with a win tonight and they lead two to one as they bat against Smith. It's two innings of shutout relief two in the third now with a fly ball off the bat of White. Mike Stanton is throwing in the Atlanta pen. Pete Smith is scheduled to bat second in the bottom seven. Lemke will lead off then the pitcher. Then Nixon. Almar one for three, a single to right in the third. He stole second in that inning. In the hole, Blouser. Fine effort, but he had no chance to get Alomar, who's two for four tonight. He came into the night two for 18. And he has equaled his hit total in this one game. Blouser shading Alomar up toward the middle. And Alomar bouncing one once it takes that. High hop that Blouser fielded, no chance to get Alomar. And he will be running here. It's a matter of what pitch he already has. One stolen base on the evening. Alomar first with one down in the seventh for Joe Carter. What a sacrifice fly in the first, delivered the first run of the game. He bounced the second and the third inning. Double. Down the left field line off Pete Smith in the fifth. Base hit by Alomar, the third allowed by Smith, the ninth hit of the night for Toronto. Make a play, Tim. We've already discussed that. Yes, we have. We mentioned Steve Avery earlier with that power leg kick. Pete Smith throws hard without that powerful left leg going up. He has a slide step toward home play. So he is uh, more difficult to run on than a guy like Steve Avery. Alomar needs one stolen base to tie Ryan Gant. He's going for it, but the pitch was fouled away. Ron Gant with 11 consecutive stolen bases. Alomar second, Ken Griffey, Otis Nixon with eight. Stolen bases have certainly been a major part of this postseason. Ron Gant has not seen much playing time of late. He's been the odd man out with Sanders playing. About his lack of playing time. <laughs> oh, and two the count on Carter. Alibar first with one out in the seventh inning. Two to one, Blue Jay. Breaking ball pulled down the line. Great backhand play by Pendleton. They get the out at seven and cannot turn the double play. Oh, that appeared to be headed for the corner, but 
Hamilton was able to spare it and erase the lead runner, Alomar. They had no chance to double up Carter. Not only does he make the play, but he turns to his right. It's tougher to throw from that angle. Boy, that is a terrific play by Terry Pendleton to get the lead runner. You can see from this play why he is a three-time gold glover. Pendleton would love, obviously, for the first time in his career to be in the winner's circle at the World Series. He's played in three World Series prior to tonight and has been on the losing team all three times. The ominous record holder, Fred Merkel, who was in five World Series without being in a winner. Fred, of course, the author of Merkel's Boner back in, in 1908. When he failed to advance on a base hit by a teammate, he got the ball, ran and touched second base for the force out back in 1908. Fred played on five without winning any. P.B. Reese played on five losing World Series teams before finally breaking through with a win in 1955. Pete Smith working to Dave Winfield with a count of 0 and 1. Very high not particularly deep. Otis Nixon waves Sanders off that ends the inning. Blue Jays have now left eight men on base. Seventh inning stretch game six two one Blue Jays. A look back at another game six, this one from 1977. Yankees and Dodgers at Yankee Stadium. Reggie Jackson with three home runs to help the Yankees win game six. The first was off Bert Hooten, the second off Elias Sosa, and this one in the eighth inning off Charlie Huff. The only other player to hit three home runs in a World Series game, Babe Ruth, back in 1926. Jackson's five home runs in a series, still the record. The Yankees won that game eight to four. Won the series four games to two. Toronto trying to win this series four games to two. They have a two to one lead in game six. And a new pitcher on the mound as the Braves come up in the seventh. Todd Stottlemyre on relief of the starter David Cohn. It is his fourth appearance and he has worked exactly one inning in each appearance. Mark Lemke the first batter. And he took a breaking ball for strike one. Ball for strike two. Lemke 0 for 1 with a walk his last time up against Cohn. Jeff Treadway has moved into the on deck circle to bat for the pitcher Pete Smith. Six Toronto relief pitchers who have appeared in this series have combined for 13 and a third scoreless inning. They've allowed only five hits in 43 at bats. Off speed pitch. Lemke fouled it. Borders throws down the first. Actually appeared that Lemke missed it. That's why he had to throw down the first. Sounded like a foul tip. It was not. The first run in the ball game in the first inning. Devon White scoring on a sacrifice fly by Joe Carter. Atlanta tied it when Deion Sanders doubled in the third, stole third, and scored on a sacrifice fly by Terry Pendleton. Tandy Maldonado has the biggest hit of the ball game. A home run leading off the fourth against Steve Avery. That made it two to one, and it's still two to one in the bottom of the seventh. With one out of the bases empty, and Jeff Treadway is batting for Pete Smith. First, he batted the World Series for Treadway. He sliced one out of play. Strike one. Since Dave Winfield made the last out, what Cito Gaston could have done when he brought in Stottlemyre, he could have put Stottlemyre in the number four hole. And inserted John Olerud in the number nine hole, hole, and that way you tighten your defense. Olerud could have moved to first base, Joe Carter to right field, but I guess Cito is thinking that it's so close a game, I'll keep my best lineup in there and not subject Olerud to a possible confrontation with Mike Stanton later on. Tom Myers 0 2. Well hit, but played on a hop by Alomar. Two down. Well, we mentioned at the outset they got David Cohn to help them get over the hump to win the ALEs, to win the ALCS. 
and to win the world championship. That was the goal from day one in this season. Toronto wanted to win the world championship after nine consecutive winning seasons. Entering 1992. Cone did his part tonight, that's for sure. Six innings, four hits, he allowed only one run, walked three and struck out six. Otis Nixon went over three against Cone. Normally a two out, nobody on bunt is a bad play. But if you have as many stolen bases as Nixon does, you can turn a bunt single into a double. That's why it's a good play for a guy like Nixon. Two balls, no strikes. To the strike two and one. Action again in the Toronto bullpen. The lefty David Wells continues to throw, and he has been joined by Dwayne Ward. Two one pitch. With a looper, base hit. Over the head of the shortstop Lee and in the left field for Otis Nixon. He's one for four tonight. And as you mentioned, look out for the stolen base. Gaston on his way to the mound. May see the left hander here to try to get Deion Sanders out of the game. Not only that, it could make it more difficult for Nixon to steal off the left hander. That's what he's going to do. David Wells summoned with two down in the bottom of the seventh. The runner at first will be back in just a moment. Ron Gant has moved into the on deck circle to bat for Deion Sanders. Bobby Cox countering the move made by Cito Gaston, who brought a left handed pitcher, David Wells, into the ball game with a runner at first and two outs in the bottom of the seventh, and with Toronto leading two to one. David Wells, his fourth start, and we mentioned that the Toronto reliever started this inning for 13 in the third school inning. Braves have not scored against a Toronto reliever. And Ron Gann will try to put an end to that. Remember, an inside hitter. David Wells with a good slider, a good overhand fastball. Ron Gant loves the ball from the inside of the plate. Deion Sanders finishes the night having gone two for three with a single, a double, two stolen bases. And he scored the only run on the board for Atlanta to this point. Otis Nixon. The runner at first base. With two down in the seven. That's the slide step and a fastball on the corner for strike one to game. And one for six in the World Series. At the plate in the league championship series as well. He had just 182. Going four for 22. One of those hits was the memorable grand slam in game two off Bob Wall. Well, again, the first, a good move.
Kelly Gruber is on the line at third base to protect against the extra base hit. It makes a lot of sense. A left-hander, right-handed pull hitter. Strike zone, Gant fouled it off. One ball and two strikes. 25 hits to right field this year after only nine hits to right field last year. That's 34 hits in two years to the right side of the ballpark for Ron Gant. Gant had a disappointing regular season. We've been a 30 30 man. 30 home runs and 30 stolen bases in both 1990 and 1991. This year with 17 home runs. And in recent days, he's been somewhat of a forgotten man for the Atlanta Braves as Deion Sanders has taken center stage. Two to one Toronto in the bottom of the seventh. Two outs, Nixon at first. He is running. Gant took a ball. Borders throw. Got him. Credit David Wells with this caught stealing, keeping Nixon so close and giving Borders a chance to nail Nixon, and he did. The series dominated by pitching game six no exception two to one is the score in favor of Toronto as we head to the eighth inning the big hit in the ball game the solo home run by Candy Maldonado in the fourth and this was a big play too as Otis Nixon is nailed at second base for the first time in this postseason not only is that play important but Ron Gant now has to lead off the bottom of the eighth inning in all probability Cito Gaston will bring in Dwayne Ward who has not yielded a home run to a right-hander all year long. No swing on the first pitch of the eighth, says Jerry Crawford. He's had a busy night on the fields. The new pitcher for Atlanta is Mike Stanton. Pete Smith did his job. He pitched three scoreless innings of relief after coming on for Steve Avery. Ron Gant remains in the game in left field. I think strategically that was one of the better managerial moves by either side bringing in David Wells not only to pitch to Gant you get Sanders out of the game and you throw out Nixon and have Gant leading off against a right hander you're really doing three three things with that one move over well, the last few years even though Toronto has won three division titles in four years under Cito Gaston this man has come under almost constant criticism from the media and many Blue Jay fans. Yeah, you wonder why. Mm -hmm. Based on what we've seen in this series, you'd have to say as a strategist, he'd get high marks. <laughs> this is a man who in 1989 didn't want to become the manager. Blue Jays' ownership and management had made the decision to fire Jimmy Williams after a 12 and 24 start in 89. Cito Gaston was the hitting coach. Pat Gillick, the general manager, and Paul Beeston, the president of the Blue Jays, went to Cito Gaston's house and said, uh oh, I think I might be getting fired. <laughs> and instead, they Offered him the managing job. He said, No, Al Widmar's been on the coaching staff longer than I have. John Sullivan, why don't you give it to them? I really don't want to do it. And they said, Well, we would appreciate it if you would. It'll just be for a few days. So he took over. The Blue Jays started winning almost immediately. It took more than just a couple of days. Maldonado, a base hit. He's two for four tonight. And he owns the biggest hit in this ball game, the home run leading off the fourth off Steve Avery. That gave Toronto a two to one lead. It's still two to one here in the eighth. Just eeks it through on the left side. By the way, that home run by Maldonado, the ninth different player that has homered. Actually, eight different players have homered for the Toronto Blue Jays in this series. Maldonado with two during the ALCS. 
but his first in the World Series. He's at first with nobody out in the eighth. The Blue Jays up to an even 10 hits now. Kelly Gruber at the plate. He's 0 for 3. Pendleton in on the grass at third, expecting the bunt. It's a good bunt. Pendleton with a strong throw to Lemke to get the sliding Gruber who went in head first. It's a sacrifice, and Maldonado is in scoring position with one out. Mike Stanton almost made that very difficult for Terry Pendleton. Watch how he blocks Pendleton out of the play. Pendleton forced to barehand the ball. There's Stanton. Pendleton barehanding it. And Barry Hill going to third because nobody was there to cover. That being the catcher's responsibility. If he can't feel the ball, he just keeps going to third base. But that uh, could have been a very difficult play, and Pendleton made it look easy. Now they will make the smart move and pitch around the sizzling Pat Borders. They set up first and second with one out and a double play possibility with Manuel Lee scheduled to bat next. Borders two for three tonight for Cito Gaston. Unless Manuel Lee hits into a double play, I think we're going to see Ed Sprague in this inning. Excuse me, Sean. If Ed Sprague comes up and they bring in the right-hander, we'll obviously see John Olerud. So the Blue Jays, even though the bottom of the order is coming up, they realize that Dwayne Ward's going to come in the game in the bottom of the eighth inning. So a bunt in that situation makes all the sense in the world because you're going to pinch hit for the pitcher anyway. Manuel Lee digs in. Derek Bell has moved into the on deck circle to bat for the pitcher. Critical part of the ball game right here. With Atlanta trying to keep it a one run deficit in the eighth inning. The Blue Jays with a chance to build on a two to one lead. The runners at first and second and one out. Lee pops up the first pitch. Bream has room in foul territory. Two down. Stanton up to 17 and two thirds consecutive innings without allowing an earned run in his career in the postseason. There'll be a conference at the mound to discuss how they should approach Derek Bell. And Stanton has held opposing batters hitless in 21 at bats with runners in scoring position. That is going back to last year against the Minnesota Twins. Well, as you saw on his line graphically a moment ago, hasn't appeared very often in postseason, but when he has, things have happened. He was on base for Sprague's home run in game two. He also scored a big run in the championship series against Oakland. To the right side, Breen. Goes to the shortstop, Blouser. That ends the inning. Blue Jays squander another chance. They leave two men on base. They've stranded ten. Bottom of the eighth. 2-1 Toronto. Into deep left center for Mitchell. And we'll see you tomorrow night. The Twins forced a game seven last year when in the 11th inning, Kirby Puckett hit a solo home run off Charlie Liebrand for a 4-3 win. Of course, Jack Morris... Pitch 10 shutout innings in game seven to give Minnesota the world championship. Dwayne Ward on in relief for Toronto. The Blue Jays six outs away from their first world championship. Ward will face Ron Gant, who was at the plate when Nixon was thrown out trying to steal, ending the seventh. Then Terry Pendleton and David Justice, batters two, three, and four. A hard throwing right hander misses inside with ball one. Wayne Ward has won two of the three games that Toronto has won. He has struck out five. He has walked no one, allowing only one hit in two and a third innings. Gant 
to right, sinking fast. Winfield! Did he catch it? Yes, he did! Great tumbling catch by Dave Winfield in right for the first out of the eighth inning. On the catch, Winfield digging up the turf as he drops to his knees and makes the play. Fine play by Winfield. Ron Gant bidding for the leadoff hit. Had it taken away by Winfield. Particularly a fine play given his lack of outfield time this year. Harry Pendleton, the batter. One strike the count. Pendleton drove in the only Atlanta run in this game with a sacrifice fly in the third. He singled in the first, struck out in the fifth. All of his advance tonight. Against the starter, David Cohn. Ward watches Pendleton the line one, just fouled by a couple of feet and left. So they're hitting line drives and just missing. And their bits for a base hit here in the eighth inning. We talked about how right-handers have not homered against Wayne Ward this year. Left-handers have homered five times against Wayne. The premier setup man for Tom Hinkey, who is now warming for Toronto. Even though Ward himself had 12 saves. And he could well be the number one closer next year as Hankey is a free agent this offseason. Pendleton fouls one weekly toward his own dugout. One ball and two strikes. One out, bottom of the eighth. Two to one, Toronto. If the Blue Jays win tonight, they are the world champions of baseball in 1992. One two from Dwayne Ward outside. The last time prior to the World Series that Dwayne Ward pitched in this ballpark, he was a member of the Braves in 1986, and they were on their way to a last place finish. Chuck Tanner was the manager. Ward was traded to Toronto for Doyle Alexander. The Braves turned around and traded Doyle Alexander for John Smoltz. Struck him out. The foul tip squeezed by Borders for the second out of the eighth. And they're hanging on every pitch. Some 40,000 gathered at the Sky Dome in Toronto tonight to watch on the Jumbotron scoreboard in center field. David Justice. 0 for 3 tonight. Fastball missed outside. 1 0 on Justice. Low. Now Justice has almost the entire left side of the infield to shoot for because they do use the shift again with Lee the shortstop on the right side of the infield and Gruber appears to be guarding the line. He's not as close to the line as you would ordinarily be guarding the line, but he's a lot closer to the line than he has been the other times Justice has been up with the shift on. Now the Blue Jays would love for him to do that, to take a shot to left field. Just for a base hit with two out and nobody on. That's why that's one of the reasons the shift is on. A little harmless single does nothing. At least that's the Blue Jays thinking in this situation, and that's proper thinking. Justice is thinking long ball. Ball three, three balls and a strike. Atlanta has had only two hits since the third. They've had only four base runners since the third. Todd Stottlemyre, Derek Bell, and Ed Sprague left to right. 
Lonnie Smith, game five here. Ball four. The tying run is aboard with two outs in the bottom of the eighth. One thing you want to do if you're an outfielder in this situation is to protect against the extra base hit with justice at first. And for that reason, the outfield is very, very deep against Sid Green. They'll give him the single. They don't want the extra base hit. Two one Toronto with two outs and a runner at first. In the bottom of the eighth, Sid Green the batter. He looked at a fastball for a strike. Sid has walked twice tonight and fly to left. Bear in mind the fact we mentioned earlier, Sid Green has never driven in a run in World Series competition. Tonight is his 12th World Series start. And that's a fly ball to left, not deep. Maldonado takes the catch. The Toronto Blue Jays three outs away from the World Championship. And they love it at Skydome. Out of the ninth, 2-1 Blue Jays. Thanks to Captain Marshall and the crew of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes for the overhead shots tonight, courtesy of Goodyear. Ninth inning of Game 6, Toronto leads 2-1. to one. They lead the series three games to two. All three of the Toronto victories in this series have come by one run. The top of the order coming up for the Jays in the ninth, Devon White, two for four with singles in the first and fourth. He scored in the first inning. Roberto Alomar and Joe Carter to follow against Mike Stanton, who's picked one scoreless inning. Line and caught. Lemke, ranging to his left, put it away for the first out of the ninth. Devon White has been hitting the ball hard all night. He hits this one hard to the left of Lemke, and Mark grabs it. Roberto Alomar, the batter. He swings at the first pitch. Seems like the Blue Jays are anxious to get to the bottom of the ninth and take their chances with a one-run lead. I was thinking uh, the same thing, even though White and Alomar hit their balls fairly well. Sometimes you're so consumed with getting there to end it, uh, you fail to concentrate on scoring another insurance run or two. But this game right now, taking on the, uh, the same tones, that the Pittsburgh Atlanta game had game seven ten days ago. Atlanta hoping it ends the same way. Joe Carter the batter. One for three a double and a sacrifice fly back in the first inning. Two pitches and two outs. The third pitch popped up. It'll be close. No play for Bream. It's a few rows back. And the crowd of 51,763 here tonight. Very quiet again. In the bottom of the ninth, the Braves have batters 6, 7, and 8 in their batting order due up. Jeff Blauser, Damon Berryhill, and Mark Lemke. Still plenty of firepower available to Bobby Cox off the bench, including Brian Hunter, who you saw a moment ago with a bat in his hand. And Lonnie Smith. You saw Terry Pendleton off the line at third base. Sid Bream the same at first. I think with two out and nobody on, this is a time where you protect against the extra base hit. One ball and two strikes. Two down and the base is empty in the top of the ninth. The Blue Jays lead two to one. Base hit, fair ball into the left field corner. Carter on his way to second with his second double of the night. I think that's a mistake by Terry Pendleton. With two outs, with nobody out or one out, you can understand him on the fat part of the field. Right now, you've got to be on the line with Joe Carter facing a left-handed batter. 
Pendleton wasn't, and it's a double for Carter. Potentially a very big double. And if the Blue Jays can get him in, it's going to knock Mike Stanton out of the ball game. Mark Wollers will be the new pitcher. We'll be back to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium in just a moment. Sean McDonough with Tim McCarver, Jim Cotton, Pat O'Brien at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, Game Six of the World Series. The Blue Jays with a win tonight, wrap up the World Series, and they lead two to one with two outs and Joe Carter at second in the top of the ninth inning. Mark Wolders on in relief to pitch to Dave Winfield. Wolders throws very hard in the playoffs against Pittsburgh. They had him on the radar gun at 100 miles per hour. First pitch to Winfield, blocked at 97. Just getting loose. Huh? <laughs> let him warm up a bit, and then he might really let one fly. First base is open. Maldonado on deck. Popped up and drifting out of play. Wolders with power has jumped ahead of Winfield 0-2. Moments ago, Mike Stanton visibly upset in the dugout as he was relieved. Crowd trying to spur Wallers onto the strikeout as Stanton looks on from the dugout. He pitched an inning in two thirds and is responsible for Carter. He keeps throwing that hard. It's going to be almost impossible for Winfield to pull the ball. They're playing toward the right in the outfield. He throws hard. Winfield did pull it, but it's foul. And into the Toronto bullpen. Tom Hankey, as you see, is throwing down there, and all likely that he will come on to start the ninth and try to save it for David Cohn. Monty Smith getting loose. And certainly looms as a distinct possibility for a pinch hitting roll in the bottom of the ninth. And Blouser, Barry Hill, and Lemke are good. Winfield pops it out of play. The previous pitch, which Winfield pulled into the bullpen, was 95 miles per hour. The way Rollers is throwing, that might be a changeup. I don't know if you noticed that gesture by Jimmy Williams. At, before we went to Bobby Cox, Jimmy Williams is responsible for the infielder's movement. And from that nodding of the head, I wonder if he's looking back on playing Pendleton on the line and thinking that that would have been the best thing. He's responsible for line placement. 0 oh 2 with two outs and Carter at second. 2 1 Toronto in the ninth inning. Bounced up the middle. Blouser throws it out. The Blue Jays have left 11. We go to the bottom of the ninth. Blouser, Barry Hill, and Lemke do. The Blue Jays, three outs away from the World Championship. Game seven of the National League Championship Series, two to one Pittsburgh. Ten days ago. Francisco Cabrera, who has not appeared in the World Series with a two-run single with two outs in the ninth, to put the Braves into the World Series. They'll need another rally of that type in the ninth to force a game seven. They're down two to one and batting against Tom Hankey. It's not surprising that Hankey is in there, but it is surprising that John Olerud is not at first for defense and that Joe Carter's not in right. That's your best defensive alignment, and Cito Gaston has opted not to use it. Reminiscent of 1986 when John McNamara let Bill Buckner in. Some said they wanted to let Buckner be on the field when they won the world championship to celebrate. He was a veteran, but all year long they had sent Dave Stapleton in for defense for Buckner and they didn't. Buckner made the error. The Red Sox never won the championship. Blouser through the hole. Gruber was playing the line. 
And the tying run is aboard with nobody out in the bottom of the ninth. Jeff Blauser, two for four tonight. You see Gruber on the line. And this two hopper gets through. Damon Berryhill with no sacrifices all year. And he'll be sacrificing here, at least trying to. Berryhill has only sacrificed seven times in his entire career. That's a good bunt. Hankey has to go to first to Alamar cover. It's a sacrifice for the first out of the bottom of the ninth. Now the tying run is in scoring position. Mark Lemke is due, but Lonnie Smith is in the on-deck circle. Tremendous roar as Smith is introduced. He was the hero of game five. His grand slam turned a three to two Atlanta lead into a seven to two Atlanta victory. It came at the expense of Jack Morris in the fifth inning. Smith just two for 12 in this World Series. It is his fifth. World Series. And as the crowd chops and chants, Francisco Cabrera has moved into the on deck circle to bat for the pitcher. Cabrera, the hero of the dramatic Game 7 victory in the playoffs against Pittsburgh, has not appeared in the World Series. And once again, the wild pitch could play a part. Hickey to be effective has to keep it down. First pitch, a strike over the outside corner at the knees. A one strike pitch. Fouled away, and Smith is in the hole, 0 and 2. We're in the bottom of the ninth. The Toronto Blue Jays lead two to one. Smith at the plate with rally caps and evidence in the Atlanta dugout. One up, Jeff Blaus with the tying run at second. Now the 0-2 pitch. Just missed. Hankey took something off it and missed inside. Two pitch. Check swing and a ball high. Two and two. <laughs> Bounced foul. Still two balls and two strikes. Lonnie 
Smith has worked the count from 0-2 to 3-2. Lauser at second with one out in the bottom of the ninth. The Blue Jays lead 2-1. If they win this game, they win the World Series. against Smith and now Borders wants to talk. You don't want to try him on another pitch like that. That ball was hittable. Smith fouling it back. Just missing it. Francisco goes to the mound to talk about how they will pitch to Francisco Cabrera. A lot of things come to mind right now, and one is the trail runner, Lonnie Smith. Bobby Cox has said that he is the toughest base runner trying to take a second baseman out of a double play. On a ball that allows Smith to get to a middle infielder, they're going to have to be careful they don't overthrow it first to allow the tying run to score. Cabrera, a fastball hitter. to Cabrera, a ball low and away. Francisco was traded to Atlanta in August of 1984 by the Blue Jays. Tying run at second, winning run at first, with one out of the bottom of the ninth. A double play ball would make the Blue Jays the world champions. Cabrera takes a strike. Tom Henke, Toronto's all-time save leader, trying to record the biggest save of his career in what could be his last game in a Toronto uniform. He's a free agent at the end of the year. The 1-1 one -one to Cabrera. Ball two. Nixon on deck. The 2-1. Two, two balls and two strikes. Salary is one million dollars. Francisco Cabrera makes one hundred and forty eight thousand dollars, which he uses to support a wife and two children in Atlanta. His mother and father, two brothers and two sisters in the Dominican Republic. It was unlikely that he was in the spotlight once when it mattered most. Miraculous that he's here twice. And still alive at two balls and two strikes. You can see the split fingers going into the glove 
of Tom Hinkie from that center field camera. Steve Avery, the starting pitcher for Atlanta tonight. He would be the losing pitcher if the score remains this way. The 2-2 two -two to Cabrera. Back to the screen again. A tracer to left field. Watch Maldonado come in and now leap. And you could see Manny Lee in front of the on that shot leaping with Maldonado. Nicks in the batter. Two outs, bottom of the ninth. Runners at first and second. The Blue Jays lead two to one. Swing and a miss by Nixon for strike one. He's one for four tonight. He singled his last time up. Two outs, a runner at second base and first base. Infielders reminded to knock the ball down if they can't make a play to save the run. Two. Otis Nixon has only six career home runs, one of them off Tom Hankey. The Blue Jays won the strike away from the World Championship. The 0 2 pitch. Slap to the left side of him. Bowser's being waved in. Maldonado's throw is over everything. It's a tie ball game. Otis Nixon took an 0 2 pitch in the left field. Cabrera's ball went 10 days ago. Blouser. Safe. Tie ball game. Now the winning run is at third for Atlanta in the bottom of the ninth as the Braves try to force a game seven tomorrow night. A single and an RBI for Nixon. No error charged on the play. They ruled that Nixon took second on a throw to the plate. Ron Gant, the hitter. He entered the ball game as a pinch hitter and lined to right. He had a hit taken away from him on a nice tumbling catch by Dave Winfield. Last inning. Old way foul went out of play. One strike on Gint. Charlie Liebrandt warming up in the bullpen. When we go to extra innings, he will be the pitcher for Atlanta. He was the losing pitcher in game six a year ago against Minnesota. He 
the 0 1 to Gant. This is certainly a great chance for Gant to erase his memories of the 1992 postseason. They have not been pleasant. In the World Series, he's one for seven. The 1 1 pitch blocked by Borders. He has to block everything with the winning run on third base. Pitching around Ron Gant. Now the 3 1 pitch. Hop foul straight back and out of play. Send the ball game into extra innings. One run for the Braves in the ninth. Two to the score as we head for the tenth inning. Willis Nixon appropriately in the spotlight of that promo. His single drove in the game tying run to make it 2 2 after nine. And as we go to the tenth, Charlie Liebrandt becomes the fifth pitcher of the night for the Braves. And there's a new second baseman in the ball game as well. Rafael Belliard takes over. He played only one inning at second base during the regular season. He's celebrating his 31st birthday tonight. Charlie Liebrandt's first appearance in the World Series. The last time that he appeared in a World Series was game six of last year when Kirby Puckett hit a home run in extra innings to win game six for the Minnesota Twins. I have never seen a more disconsolate player than Charlie Liebrandt was after that game. Chance to atone. Candy Maldonado, Kelly Gruber, and Pat Borders to bat for Toronto in the 10th. Blue Jays were one strike away from the world championship. Now they'll have to go to extra innings to earn it. Maldonado. He's had an eventful night. Two for four at the plate. His home run in the fourth inning made it two to one. Will remain that way until the run. For Atlanta in the bottom of the ninth. Maldonado nearly misplayed the ball hit by Cabrera in the bottom of the ninth. Then airmailed the catcher Borders with his throw. Trying to cut down Blauser at the plate. Blauser scored the run that made it two to two. Lee Brandt quickly ahead of Maldonado. No balls and two strikes. Lee Brandt's best pitch is a circle change. It is similar, if you followed the earlier game, similar to Tommy Glavin, the left-hander for the Braves. Circle change. He holds the thumb and the forefinger together and throws the ball with the last three fingers. Kelly Gruber on deck. The 1-2 pitch. 
to short. Played nicely on a hop by Blauser. One out of the ten. Lee Brand, a performer in postseason play in 1985. Member of a world championship team that year with the Kansas City Royals. And he was the winning pitcher in game seven of the playoffs that year when Kansas City finished off its comeback from three games to one down to beat the Toronto Blue Jays. Kelly Gruber lines a base hit in the center field. So the Blue Jays have the go ahead run aboard with one out. Gruber has just his second hit of the World Series. He's two for 19. And a threat to run with above average speed. Pat Borders, two for three, a single, a double. Last time up, he was intentionally walked. 2-2 two, two, the score on the top of the 10. Toronto up to 12 hits. Jays out hitting Atlanta 12-7, and all night long we've been talking about the squandered opportunities for Toronto earlier in the night. Those look not much bigger now. They've left 11 men on base. I think if Gruber does run, it'll be part of a hit and run. I wouldn't work a straight steal in a situation like this. Border's been too hot with a bat. The thought being that with Borders hitting 474, two for three tonight, that he could drive Gruber to third instead of taking a chance for him stealing second base. Lee Brent to the plate, Borders with a fly ball. Ron Gannon left. Two down. We're in the bottom of the tenth against Tom Hankey. The Braves have the meat of their order due up. Terry Pendleton, David Justice, and Sid Bream. They have Jeff Reardon throwing in their bullpen. Lee Brandt, the fifth Atlanta pitcher of the night. Steve Avery started, went four, allowed the two Toronto runs. Pete Smith. Pitched three shutout innings. Mike Stanton, an inning and two thirds of scoreless relief. Mark Wolders faced one man and got him out. Now Lee Brandt, who will pitch next to Pat Tabler. Manuel Lee was the scheduled hitter. Cito Gaston elected not to hit for Lee in the eighth when he batted with first and second and one out, but at the time, Gaston had a two to one lead. He was more concerned with defense and Lee is an excellent glove man at short. Now he's thinking about offense. And Leo Mazzoni, the pitching coach, is out to the mound to chat with Libra. Jimmy Key is up and throwing for the Toronto Blue Jays. I was looking down there. He had his jacket on and he was rotating his left arm. And he is up and throwing. Tom Hickey has not gone two innings all year and 57 appearances. In 55 of those 57, he went one inning, even though he has gone one and two thirds in this series. One time. That was game three. I beg your pardon, that was the American League Championship Series in game three. Tabler up. In a 2-2 ball game in the 10th with two outs and Gruber at first. Lee Brand starts him with a fastball for a strike. He, the only lefty still available to Cito Gaston. Mike Timlin and Mark Eichhorn have not appeared out of the bullpen for Toronto tonight. Atlanta, on the other hand, has Jeff Reardon, John Smoltz, Marvin Freeman, Tommy Glavin scheduled for tomorrow night. They also have David Need, Need the young right-hander, who has not appeared in any game yet. He will probably be the last resort for Bobby Cox, Need a rookie, and a late addition to the World Series roster. 
Tabler five for 14 lifetime against Lieber including a home run Ruber back to first. And Ed Sprague is moved into the on deck circle. The pitcher is due up next. That's why they got key up in a hurry. And as we mentioned a moment ago, Pendleton, Justice, and Bream, the scheduled trio of brave swingers in the bottom of the tenth. Lee Brandt to the plate with a 1 1 pitch. Check swing. Lee Brandt has it. On to the bottom of the tenth. 2 2 the score. The Atlanta Braves scored a run with two outs in the bottom of the ninth to tie the game at two and force extra innings. That run of the ninth by the Braves. Ended the Blue Jays bullpen record streak of 15 and a third consecutive scoreless innings. That is a record for World Series played by a bullpen, but it ended with the Blue Jays one strike away from the World Championship. Pendleton, Justice, and Bream do up. Justice and Bream, left handed hitters. Pendleton a switch hitter Jimmy Key warming up in the bullpen. He's a left hand Pendleton one of seven switch hitters in the lineups tonight and that is a World Series record never have so many switch hitters appeared in a World Series game. Well, a number of records have been set in this series and the way it's going. There will probably be at least one or two more. Yeah. Before we finish. Yeah. Tom Hankey victimized with a game tying run facing Pendleton. It was one for three with a first inning single. He had a sacrifice fly for an RBI in the third. He struck out twice since then. Strike on the outside corner. Pendleton. Alfredo Griffin is the new shortstop for Toronto as they hit for Manuel Lee in the top of the 10. Pendleton started to pull the trigger and laid off the pitch low and in. Two balls and a strike. Jays are guarding the line. It didn't pay off. And Jeff Blauser bounced the leadoff single through last inning and scored the tying run. It pays off this time as Carter was perfectly positioned for Pendleton. One out in the bottom of the tenth. There's Joe Carter in your picture. And he makes a relatively easy play on the Pendleton high chopper. And that looks like it's going to be all for Tom Hickey. It will indeed. Jimmy Key trots in to become the new Toronto hurler. We'll return to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium after this word from your local station.
Huh? Yeah. No? Yeah, right. Two right-handed pitchers are left for Toronto. Mike Temlin. And Mark Eichhorn. Of course, Jack Morris pitched two nights ago in an emergency. I would imagine uh, Cito Gaston could call on Morris. Jimmy Key, 1-0. Oh. He won uh, game four up in Toronto. He called it his proudest moment as a member of the Blue Jays. Now he has perhaps a chance to be on the mound when they win their first world championship. He was emotional when he came out of that ball game after seven two thirds innings, tipping his cap because he said he realized that it was probably going to be his last outing in a Toronto uniform. He's another free agent at the end of the year. Tell you statistically, uh, you might question this move because David Justice, unusually, is a much better career hitter against left-handers than he is right-handers. 49 points better. Big swing and a miss for strike one. Justice 0 for 3 tonight with a walk in the 8th inning off Dwayne Ward. He'll be followed by Sid Breen. 2-2 two -two the score. One out, bases empty, bottom of the 10th. Check swing. And a foul to the Toronto dugout. Key quickly ahead, no balls and two strikes. The 0-2 pitch. Bounce down the line and foul. Jimmy Key scheduled to lead off the next inning. Cito Gaston did not make a double switch. Now you could have uh, brought in John Olerud, moved Carter to left field, and taken Maldonado out of there and allowed Key to hit in the number six spot. Number five spot for Maldonado. Would have made him the sixth batter of the next inning. Uh huh. One and two now on Justice. <laughs> Through key, but Griffin is playing him perfectly. The shift pays off for Toronto. The shortstop on the right side of the infield. The ball came right to Alfredo Griffin for the second out of the 10. Actually, Griffin was shielded from that ball. He did. He took one step to his left, and then he went back to his right. The ball right back through Jimmy Key, and Alfredo makes the play. Sid Bream. 0 for 2 tonight with two fly balls to left. He has also walked twice. Jimmy Key was murder on lefties during the regular season. He held them to a 176 batting average and only two home runs. Only Mark Langston fared better against left handed hitters among all left handed starters in baseball. Chopped down to first, Carter. Flips to Key, and the Braves go in order in the bottom of the 10th. We had the 11th. The Blue Jays coming up in a 2 2 ball game. Welcome back to game six of the 1992 World Series from Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. 2 2 the score. The Atlanta Braves tied the score on a base hit by Otis Nixon with two outs. In the bottom of the ninth, that brought Jeff Blauser in from second. Nixon has said several times that he thinks he is enjoying this postseason more than anybody else participating because he was not able to take part in the postseason a year ago, serving a drug suspension. How about this? Jimmy Key's going to hit for himself. So it looks like Cito Gaston has determined that Jimmy Key, for the most part, is a starting pitcher in this role. At least until the next time the pitcher hits. Key, a 
Then the top of the order, Devon White and Roberto Alomar against Charlie Liebrand, who's pitched one score this inning. He allowed one hit in the tenth. This is the first major league at bat for Jimmy Key. He's been in the majors since 1984. The last time a relief pitcher, and that's what Key is tonight, hit this late in the game in this ballpark. Rick Aguilera made the last out last year in the 12th inning with the bases loaded. Aguilera, the stopper for the Minnesota Twins. Jimmy Key was an, an outstanding hitter in college at Clemson. His first team All ACC player as a pitcher and as a DH. Asking a lot of it, though, would you mm. say? Might be a little bit rusty. Yeah. <laughs> Hasn't been in college since 1982. <laughs> he had a career 300 average for the Clemson Tigers. A pop up, Bream has it. Jimmy probably had some batting practice yesterday. The Toronto pitchers did hit during the workout, and the man who threw batting practice to them was the general manager, Pat Gillick, a former minor league pitcher. That was very sore when we saw him in the clubhouse before the game today. There's Pat, the general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. Peter Widrington on the left. Chairman of the board. Devon White, the hitter. Oh, and one on White. He's two for five tonight, singles in the first and fourth innings. He scored a run way back in the first. Lee Brandt misses up and in. One and one. That was for effect. Rarely does Charlie Lee Brandt come inside to a right hander, especially in a game situation. When he intentionally throws a strike inside, he'll go back outside to White. Lee Brand ahead of White, one and two. With one out in the 11th inning, 2-2 two -two the score. Roberto Alomar is on deck. They hit him. The crowd thought John Shulock was calling him out on strikes. Instead, he was indicating that the ball brushed Devon White, and he has first base with one out. Lee Brand coming inside just a little bit too much, and it hits the left thigh of Devon White. White not trying to get out of the way, but he tried enough, in the opinion of John Shulock. The ball just Hitting his left thigh. He's at first and a threat to run with Roberto Alomar up. Lee Brandt goes to first. Von White stole his first stolen base of the World Series back in the first inning. It set up the run he scored in the first. Alomar two for five. The Lee Blue Br Jays have, I'm sorry, Tim, the Blue Jays have had a hit in every inning tonight except this, the 11th. going to say Lee Brandt has 16 pickoffs on the year. 16. An excellent move to first base. 12 pickoffs last year. He goes over to first again. As a matter of fact, the Toronto Blue Jays have had exactly one hit in every inning prior to the 11th, except the fourth, in which they had three hits. Terry Mulholland of Philadelphia. Alomar squared to punt and took the first pitch to him from Lee Brandt low for ball one. That was a show me bunt right there. No way is Alomar bunting with one out and white at first base. Maybe a hit and run here. If you're the runner at first base in a hit and run situation, you have to make sure the pitcher pitches. 
The responsibility is on the hitter to make contact. Lee Brandt will again go to first to hold White close. To the plate and lined into center field to hit. White to second and he'll stop there. Roberto Alomar with three hits tonight. He started the night with only two hits in this series. First and second and one out for Toronto in the 11th. Alomar waits on the change up. He gets it. And delivers. I don't think there is any way that Bobby Cox is going to allow Lee Brent to face Joe Carter. Jeff Reardon is warm in the bullpen. Tough decision right here. Mm -hmm. Made particularly tough by Reardon's failures in this series. Well, if you're not going to bring Reardon in in this situation, why is he warming up? That's the question. But I was going to pose to you. Joe Carter will face Lee Brandt. One strike on Carter, who has two hits tonight, a pair of doubles. Outstanding speed on the base pass for the Blue Jays. Devon White at second, Roberto Alomar at first, and one out. Joe Carter had a sacrifice fly back in the first inning. That was nearly four hours ago. Lee Brandt nearly threw it into center field. Belliard had to leap to field it and reach over the head of Devon White at the same time. It was an awkward twist towards second by Charlie Liebrand. By the time he turns, he sees that White is there and Belliard has his left arm serving as a necklace for Devon White. <laughs> The 0 1 to Carter. Blowing in one ball and one strike. In his career against Charlie Lee Brent, Joe Carter is a 275 hitter, 11 for 40. He has never hit a home run off Charlie Lee Brent. Take off. Carter lifts one to center, not deep. Devon White jogs back to second as Nixon makes the catch for the second out. We're in the 11th, 2 2 to score. Bobby Cox has Jeff Blauser, Damon Berryhill, and Raphael Belliard scheduled to bat in the bottom of the 11th inning. Bobby Cox aware of all the stats and he knows that Dave Winfield is a 302 lifetime hitter against Charlie Liebrand including four home runs and 53 at bats against Liebrand. 
Tonight, Winfield's 0 for 4 with a first inning walk, and now he's 4 for 21 in the series. Winfield, a very good off-speed hitter. You can understand why Winfield hits Lee Brandt well. Lee Brandt is not a hard thrower. He relies on his changeup. Uh, Winfield will get either the fastball or the changeup. Lee Brandt does have a curveball, but you don't want to throw anything but your best in this situation. Changeup for a strike. One ball and one strike. back towards second. Belliard wasn't very close to the bag. Dave Winfield has only driven in one run in this series. He tries to erase the painful memories of his only previous World Series experience in 1981. All the bad memories would go away with a hit right here. In the dirt, blocked by Barry Hill, two balls and a strike. Winfield with runners in scoring position, one for seven. He's 0 for three tonight. And you mentioned Winfield trying to erase past the World Series. That's what Charlie Lee Brand's trying to do, too. Winfield has ended three innings tonight with the hit by Alomar here in the 11th. The Blue Jays have had at least one hit in every inning. They have 13 hits in all. But they've left 12 men on base, had a runner thrown out of the plate. And hit into a double play. And now Lee Brandt is even with Winfield at two balls and two strikes. Fastball slicing the corner. Right there. Two two the score with two men on, two outs, and a count of two and two. In the 11th inning of Game 6 of the World Series. 2-2 Two -two pitch. Just missed. Low and away. The count is full. And now the runners will get the jump with the 3-2 and two pitch up coming in two outs. go on the 3 2 to Winfield. Down the line, a base hit into the left field corner. White has scored. Alomar comes around. The ball gets away from Gant. It's a two run double for Dave Winfield. And a 4 2 Toronto lead. base hit of the World Series ever for Dave Winfield. Boy, did he save the right time to get it. Toronto up by two. Winfield had come to the plate 44 times in World Series play without an extra base hit before that one. A two-run double driving into Von White and Roberto Alomar, and the Blue Jays are ahead again, four to two. The base hit by Winfield, the 14th Blue Jay hit of the night. He's in scoring position for Candy Maldonado. And we might add that that is exactly what Winfield hit. He hit a changeup, the off-speed pitch. We talked about his prowess with the straight change. Lee Brand had to go to his strength. But Winfield was stronger. 
for the second year in a row. Game six agony for Charlie Libra. decision to stick with Lee Brandt to face Carter Winfield and now Maldonado is a clear indication that he is a little bit gun shy about using Reardon yep given Reardon's problems earlier in the series Jeff Reardon gave up two hits and both were game winners those hits the game winning home run by Sprague the two run homer in game two that gave Toronto the 5 4 win and the hit in game three by Maldonado, the man at the plate now, in the ninth inning, with the bases loaded and one out, and gave Toronto the three to two win in that ball game. The two two pitch popped up. Rafael Belliard on the outfield grass ends the inning. But the Blue Jays get two huge runs on Dave Winfield's first ever extra base hit in the World Series. They're three outs away again and will return after this word from your local station. Jeff Blauser, Damon Berryhill, and Rafael Belliard, the scheduled three for Atlanta in the bottom of the 11th. The Braves will need to dig into their bag of tricks again. Scored a run in the bottom of the ninth, the fourth extra innings. They'll need two to keep it alive in the bottom of the eleventh. They're ready in Toronto to have the biggest party that city has ever seen. A lot of the Braves were irritated when in Thursday morning's paper, the Blue Jays celebratory parade route was printed in the newspaper. We might bring those parade plans back out of the drawer again. Not much left on the bench for Bobby Cox, Brian Hunter and Javier Lopez. They're right handed hitters and that's it. Remember again 10 days ago the Braves trailed by two in that bottom of the ninth inning. And it was Jeff Blauser who scored the tying run in the ninth inning tonight. Jimmy Key. With a chance to earn his second win of the series. And who would have thought that when this ball game began? Facing Jeff Blauser. Line to left. Here we go again. Blauser started the ninth with a base hit and scored the game tying run. He starts the 11th with a base hit. That'll bring the tying run to the plate. So Blauser starts it off again. Talk about an uphill battle. Damon Berryhill is not a strong hitter from the right side of the plate. Raphael Belliard is on deck. He is not a strong offensive hitter. But if Barry Hill can get on, then Belliard will be allowed to bunt him over. Up the middle. Bad hop and Griffin couldn't glove it. Blauser continues to third. He'll get there without a throw. Had he fielded it, it was a perfect double play ball with Barry Hill running, but it bounced up at the last moment. Griffin couldn't handle it. Now the tying run is aboard at first base. John Smoltz. Running for David Berryhill with nobody out. The ball came up on Griffin. Watch how it scoots along and right there. It comes up and hit him in the thumb of a glove. It's going to be an error, but it was a tough hop. Blauser goes to third on the play. And Belliard, I would imagine, will still be bunted because only the runner at first matters. It is an error charge to Griffin, the first Toronto error of the night. Rafael Belliard, who is first at bat in this World Series. 
Deering in his fourth game. Prior to tonight, he has come into defense. He does bunt toward first, and it's a foul ball. If you remember in that NLCS game seven, ninth inning, Jose leaned the sure-handed second baseman of the Pirates made an error that led to a run when the Braves scored three times in the bottom of the ninth to win it. Belliard hit just 2-11 during the regular season. He squares to butt again. This time it's in play. The runner holds at third. Key to Alomar covering for the first out. But now the tying run is in scoring position. Blauser still at third. Smoltz has moved up to second. And a nice bunt by Belliard. Jimmy Key thought about second. You can see him looking at second base. And now he goes to first. Brian Hunter. Hitting 250 in the World Series. He's one for four. His one hit a single. He drove in a run with a sacrifice fly earlier in this series. The Blue Jays lead four to two. One out, two men in scoring position in the bottom of the 11th. And Borders out to the mound to discuss the strategy with Hunter, who's dangerous, particularly against left handed pitching. He had 12 of his 14 home runs during the regular season off lefties, and Hunter averaged a home run every 13 times up against left-handed pitching in the regular season. Yeah, he only started against right-handed pitchers eight times this year. You can see he is much better against left-handers, 90 points better this year. But I guess Cito Gaston is going with the experience of Jimmy Key. Key's first pitch, a ball to Hunter. Hunter was one for three against Jimmy Key in game four. That one hit was a bunt single. Off the end of the bat, down to first. Carter makes the play for the second out. A run scores. It's four to three, Toronto. And now the tying run is at third base. But the Braves are again down to their final out. And again, it will be Otis Nixon who singled with two outs and two strikes the count in the bottom of the ninth to drive in the game-tying run. It was Jeff Blauser who made it 2-2, two two and we went to extra innings. And Cito Gaston wants to talk to Jimmy Key. It is doubtful that he will take him out of the game. I think he wants to remind the corners, Joe Carter, and Kelly Gruber and Jimmy Key, the pitcher, that Nixon will bunt. That's what makes Nixon, as a batter, with a runner on third and two outs, most dangerous because of the possibility of the bunt or the infield hit. John Smoltz represents the tying run. Well, we're going to go to the right hander. Mm. Mike Timlin will be the new pitcher for Toronto when we come back. Mike Timlin pitched one inning in game five. That was the seventh inning, if you remember. And what pressure on this young man just to get one out. Jimmy Key was taken out of the game. We think because Otis Nixon is a much better hitter against left handed pitching. Mike Timlin will be pitching to Nixon, and interestingly, Nixon got the hit to tie the game in the ninth inning from the left side. And there they are, the numbers for Otis Nixon. So that's why the Brock Timlin in to switch Nixon around. A lot of things run through a manager's mind here. Otis Nixon, as a left-handed batter, gets down to first a lot quicker than he does from the right side. He's a better bunter as a left-handed batter. If the ball is hit to an infielder, they better hurry. 
Nixon two for five tonight including the RBI single with two outs and a count of 0 and 2 in the bottom of the ninth that drove in Jeff Blauser to make it 2 2. Mike Timlin saved only one game this year. He has only four major league saves. Now he's on to save the biggest win in Toronto Blue Jay history. With a tying run at third and two down in the bottom of the 11th. 4 3 Blue Jays. John Smoltz, the pinch runner at third. Timlin. Nixon butts. Timlin on it. Throws to first. For the first time in history, the World Championship banner will fly north of the border. The Toronto Blue Jays are baseball's best in 1992. Mike Temlin the save how unlikely was that final pitching scenario all four wins in this World Series for Toronto by one run including game six four three the final in 11 and only their 16th year as a major league franchise the Toronto Blue Jays have won the world championship. Canada. What a series. We'll be back in just a moment. 